and welcome everyone to session one of the Social Impacts of Long COVID Symposium. Thank you everyone for coming along, presenters and audience members. Um, we'll have nine presentations of 15 minutes each this morning. And then later on today at Eastern Australian Standard Time, it's actually 7 p.m., beginning at 7 p.m., we will commence session two. That's to allow for the presenters from different time zones to be able to come in and um, present without sort of having to do it in the middle of the night or something like that. Um, I'd first like, I'm Deborah Lupton I'm from US, UNSW Sydney. I'd like to begin with acknowledging that UNSW Sydney is on the lands of the Bedigal and Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation. Um, and I'm actually coming to you today from Canberra, the Nambri and Ngunnawal peoples, traditional sovereign lands. Um, and for all of these territories, sovereignty was never ceded. Now, We'd like to kick off first with Mark Davis from Monash University. So, Mark, if you could get us going, thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's great to be connecting with you all today. I hope you can hear me properly. Yes. Cool. So, um, uh, in this talk, I consider I want to talk about this notion of restitution narrative. And, and link it with long COVID. So Arthur Frank and many others have examined illness in terms of before and after a significant threat to life. Where the effects of disease can be erased, cured even, restoration of life to what it was is available. When restitution is not possible, illness becomes ontologically troublesome. The quest for an acceptable existence under these conditions comes to the fore. Restitution for illness narrative theorists is the basis for critique of biopolitics that minimize and exclude. For COVID, restitution narrative, how we will live with the virus, is I think reflected in scientific, public health and political debate. Some have deployed restitution to erase alternative experiences, and in particular long COVID, and its links with inequity. Immunity, which is implicated in long COVID, has become a, uh, a key flashpoint for political dissent over restitution. So these um, uh, graphs come from the CDC, and what they reveal is deep structural inequities in the you know, kind of reported experience. Marked class and ethnic patterning of long COVID outcomes. Now, these will be uh, familiar gradients for any of us working in health, but it's important to hold on to these structural differences when we reflect on long COVID, uh, because it, it helps us to avoid becoming reductive and universalizing in our explanations of the pandemic. Turning to science, uh, it, uh, my argument is that uh, scientific dissent uh, is an important way of thinking about uh, restitution. So uh, Great Barrington and Declaration, the John Snow Memorandum, uh, represented contrasting viewpoints. So each of these was comprised of scientists who advocated for different positions on the pandemic and how to manage it. The Barrington Declaration advocated for the cessation of social isolation due to worries about its efficacy and economic impact. They also advocated for herd immunity. That is that humans would eventually develop immunity to the virus and we should let that happen. John Snow argued that ceasing social isolation was unethical and unscientific due to the biomedical features of the virus. Too many people would die and herd immunity would not be achieved. So there are other examples of these debates uh, in, in the UK, we had Indy Sage set up as a kind of contrast to the Sage Committee adv advising government. And in Australia, we had Os Sage. As the fragments suggest, dissensus was expressed through notions of herd immunity, immunity debt, natural immunity, hybrid immunity. We even had a moment with immunity passports, if you recall. 
and the perennial immune boosting is, is with us. So this debate over immunity, I think, can be read as clashing positions on restitution and how it might be possible. Barrington Declaration sees in herd immunity the means to restore life to what it was. John Snow, more cautiously and significantly, foresee that the cost of life and health is not acceptable. <clears throat> But note the universalized immune self at stake here. Given long COVID's inequities are so sharp, the universal immune self represented here glosses over diversity. <clears throat> the promise of restitution is also evident in political discourse. This example comes from Hansard and records a statement by the Australian Prime Minister to Parliament on the 13th of May, 2020. Uh, and in it, he talks about a kind of bridge metaphor, a uh, striking metaphor, kind of a, a very literal kind of metaphor to supply a, a path through the pandemic, a life restored post COVID. Also note how this way of representing the crisis is created on behalf of the public. It's significant that leaders sought to narrate the COVID in this way on our behalf. Another common mode of restitution is found in the saying, live with the virus. In this news, news item from The Independent, Boris Johnson's advice for the British public in the run-up to winter 2021 was reported in this way. The pandemic is far from over, but thanks to our phenomenal vaccine program, new treatments and testing, we're able to live with the virus without significant restrictions on our freedoms. So there's quite a lot going on here. Vaccines are made out to be a form of freedom, whereas lockdowns presumably were not. The collective we is significant because it raises questions of which we is addressed here. Life with the virus, with the vaccine and without restriction is a kind of pastiche, a kind of fabrication assemblage of restitution. Strong here too is a method of life with the pandemic narrated on our behalf. I think these repeated messages indicate that for some, there's a kind of message about refusing uncritical restitution, restitution is also to refuse the freedoms and privileges of post-pandemic citizenship. <clears throat> some other examples appear in news media, and we can see how scientific dissensus is brought into connection with these politics and used to frame how we should live with the virus. In this example, the journalist, I won't read it out, of course, weaves a narrative on politics and science that borrows from restitution. They talk about, you know, making decisions guided by science, when we know that there's some, some kind of, you know, conflict there, and not short-term political expediency, which is kind of ironic. And then a little bit later on, how we, we should continue to live with the virus in all our forms. Live with the virus here is deployed as the means by which a form of restitution becomes available. But there's not much room for other stories, including the long COVID experience. In this example, uh, it's an interesting turning of restitution. Dissenting voices are met with some condemnation. So there's a, a phrase here about how those who seek uh, COVID zero is a way of demonizing those who sustain, who sustain the view that the virus should be suppressed as much as possible. The reference to anti-vaxxers helps to discredit dissent uh, and further the live with the virus line. This way of narrating science and politics erases dissent and furthers an uncritical restitution narrative. Again, COVID's inequities are absent or minimized. For narrative theorists, restitution is not a thing in itself, but the basis by which life with ongoing illness is navigated um, as a matter of ethics and justice. This narrative perspective on restitution is missing here. The dramatic uh, CDC long COVID graphs I showed you at the beginning of my talk uh, show how inequity shades lived experience and that poorer and less well-educated people face increased threat to health, to their health. But the graphs also depict privilege in the sense that affluent, literate people faced fewer risks in America. 
So for the privileged, uncritical res uh, restitution may be possible because of the resources and power they have to care for their health. Admonishment uh, to live with the virus and quiet and dissent serves them the interests of privilege. So to summarize, investment in restitution negates complication and resistance. This seems especially true for long COVID, which is a story that has to contend with the apparently politically favored uh, post COVID story. Restitution is, uh, as it is deployed to further post COVID political reason, makes it harder for the pandemic's discontents to craft accounts of their own experiences. Refusing restitution in an absolute sense seems to mean a denial of uh, a full status as post-COVID citizen. And as others have noted, restitution as ideology helps to erase diverse majority world COVID experience. I think it's so important that we have symposia like this because we can start to interrogate this, the uses of uh, restitution uh, and build coalitions and a shared kind of uh, way of storying COVID that accommodates the diversity we see in relation to long COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Really great to start off with a strong health sociology focus. Um, cool. If we, um, if, yeah, if you can stop sharing, yeah, just while okay. we're, you're responding to any questions, uh, Kathy, if you could, um, the next speaker, Kathy Anderson, if you could start just sharing your screen, just so you're ready to go once we finished with the discussion of Mark's talk, please. Um, so I'd just like to kick off, I'd like to take the privilege of the convener and kick off with asking a question, Mark. Well, I can see, yeah. Kathy, you've got your presentation there. Thank you. Um, so I know that you've researched several other infectious diseases, including influenza. Um, and look, looked at the sort of pandemic narratives and discourses in relation to those kinds of outbreaks, also HIV. Can you can you see any parallels in the way that long COVID and these framing of restitution um, has occurred, you know, with this last pandemic versus those previous outbreaks and pandemics? Thank you. I guess the thing that strikes me about the early days of HIV is that uh, it was shaped around inequity already, so that uh, queer people, uh, drug users, sex workers, people from Africa became the others of that pandemic. I think what's different about influenza and then COVID is that it, uh, you know, brought us all into a kind of way of experiencing, you know, we're all potentially at risk. It's uncertain uh, who will get long COVID and what the outcomes will be. And I think that brings people, uh, <laughs> I think that brings people together differently. I will say though that um, there, are, that you know, what people with HIV, what you know, how they came together and resisted dominant constructions of the virus and risk and threat and identity. There are important foundations, tools to bring into COVID, which is very, very different. Um, you know, also COVID intersects with pre-existing conditions. So people with HIV, hepatitis C, immune deficiency, dysregulation, uh, older, uh, you know, who, who often get kind of marginalised in mainstream high-tech medicine anyway, um, you know, have to think about COVID very, very differently. So I think there is sort of, I want to, there are generalities possible across pandemics, but the particularities are also very valuable ways of thinking about pandemic. Definitely, I agree. Yes, it's very interesting to, to look at the differences and similarities across those different outbreaks and epidemics and pandemics. Yep. Um, Kat Fraser's got a comment. She says, we also need better access to lived experience, insights and expertise, especially the housebound, bedbound, which are very difficult to reach unless you're in their Twitter social media communities. 
and have built existing trust, building a platform for this with the community looking to build pilot programs if anyone is interested here. And Kat's got their um, email address there. Thanks, Kat. Um, I'm sure there probably will be a lot of, you know, I'm sure there will be a lot of people interested in that. Thanks, um, Sarah. I just wanted to jump on as it's late for me. I won't be staying for much longer, but it's all amazing insights that you're you're bringing to the table. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kat. So, yeah, I'm glad you got your message out there early on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be in, um, I'll be in touch with the follow-up. Yes. Uh, uh, Noah's asked if uh, there'll be a recording. Yes, there will be. It's being recorded right now. And um, I'm going to upload it with, with the Centre for Social Research in Health. That's the, one of the centres I'm in at UNSW Sydney. They make sure that they have their own sort of YouTube channel. Uh, and this will be, this is sort of seen as part of part of their seminar series in a way, a special, special part of it. Uh, so it's, it will be, everything will be uploaded to YouTube and uh, um, I guess you can either email me about it when it's ready to view. I'll be tweeting about it, of course. <laughs> a lot of people here know that I tweet very regularly about things. So, yeah, either check in through email or if you're on Twitter, check check my tweets. It'll take a few days. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned the gendered nature of long COVID. Yes, I'm sure that will be um, discussed by other presenters. Now, I'm just checking for time. Oh, okay. So... Thank you, Mark. We'll now move on to, to Cathy Anderson from the University of Sydney. Go, go ahead, Cathy, please. Thanks, Deborah. So can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All good? So, yes, my name is Cathy Anderson. I'm in the last year of my PhD candidature in the discipline of sociology and criminology within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Sydney. And as you can see, the title for my talk today is The Long Haul Contested Histories of Long COVID and ME-CFS in Australia. So firstly, I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and all First Nations people joining us today. So first, just some background of my overall thesis. So the thesis is a qualitative case study which explores the processes of knowledge production for a sociological analysis of contested chronic illnesses in Australia. I'm seeking to extend our understandings of contested chronic illnesses by utilising a sociology of knowledge and sociology of contested illnesses theoretical framework with borrowed insights from critical disability studies and analysed using reflexive thematic analysis. So today's talk is one part of my PhD research. So what I will be talking about today is the comparative early histories of how myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, commonly known as ME-CFS, and long COVID have been represented in the Australian news media. So just important to note that these are preliminary findings, analysis is still ongoing, work in progress. Um, so the pr preliminary reflexive thematic analysis identifies three prevalent themes across the data set, which encompasses contestations over knowledge production and disabilism and discrimination in relation to contested chronic illnesses. So the three themes, uh, whose narrative is this? It's not my fault, the limitations of medical knowledge and care, support and dignity are not optional. So the first theme, whose narrative is this, encompasses ontological debates, <clears throat> excuse me, of whether the illnesses are biological or if psychological in origin. And this is one of the main contestive narratives throughout all of the articles and it relates to debates about the ideology of the illnesses, which manifest in discussions about whether the illnesses are, in quotes, real. Uh, and if ME-CFS and long COVID are biological or psychological in origin. <clears throat> For example, in an article discussing a first-person account of ME-CFS in the Sydney Morning Herald, it reports that it took two years for Sydney man Michael Lyons to find a doctor who took his debilitating illness seriously. Some told him there was no medical reasons for how he was feeling. 
and that it was all in his mind. To further illustrate, in the following excerpt, Sarah, a senior nurse, age 34, who is living with long COVID, can test the biomedical framing, including dismissal of her symptoms. She's reported in an ABC News article as calling for greater recognition within the medical community of long COVID as a legitimate condition. And she further states, when I was in a mental health centre, there was a doctor there, actually two doctors there, that seemed to not think it was a real thing, that seemed to think that it was all in my head. The pain wasn't really there, when actually it really is, and this is a real issue, she says, and that's very hurtful. Oops, sorry. So the next theme is it's not my fault, the limitations of biomedical knowledge, and this encompasses contestations over responsibility for illness. So this is a counter-narrative, um, again, recurring, recurring theme throughout the articles that those living with ME-CFS or long COVID are not responsible for their ill health. This theme is portrayed in a number of different ways, including narrating their story of one as moving from previously good health um, with a strong work ethic, et cetera, prior to contracting a virus or infection. And this theme also includes responses to limitations of medical knowledge, including counter narratives to dominant biomedical framings of the illness, which differs from their lived reality. Uh, so another response to the limits of medical knowledge is creation of support groups for both emotional support and as a way to create the knowledge lacking in medical settings. Um, so, for example, I think I might have gone ahead in my slides, sorry. So, for example, Bronwyn Carter, in a letter to The Age, provides a counter-narrative that is living with ME-CFS or inhabiting the sick role long-term is not her fault by framing the illness as an unexpected and abrupt change in her life story. And she states, one, one Sunday morning I woke up with the flu, swollen glands, aching legs and fuzzy brain. I still have those symptoms today and a dozen more. That Sunday was two and a half years ago. Those years of my life are lost forever. I have chronic fatigue syndrome. I am not a hypochondriac or a malingerer. I want my old life back. Similarly, a 22-year-old international student living in Victoria who lives with long COVID uh, states, it is a, just a constant tiredness, he said. I was a very fit and active person and now even doing the simplest things, like walking from my bedroom to the kitchen exhausts me. Others are organising social media groups, such as UK mother Claire Hasty, who set up a Facebook group for those experiencing long COVID to support each other and coordinate their own knowledge about the condition, including challenging the narrative that only severe acute coronavirus can cause long-term issues. Claire, in an ABC uh, news article, asserts the following. It's one of those mysteries that we are so desperate for science and research um, to catch up with us because we have a hypothesis, she said. The science definitely needs to catch up with our experience. Even mild coronavirus can have lingering effects. And the third preliminary finding theme is care, support and dignity are not optional. And this encompasses demonstration of forms of disabilism as defined by medical sociologist Carol Thomas. So um, an example, uh, some examples of structural disabilism. Um, in the medical system, in a Sydney Morning Herald article, Jeff Bray, 22, who suffered with ME-CFS since he was five, states, I have suffered discrimination because of the syndrome. I feel that if they come up with a diagnostic test, it will basically validate that there is something definitely wrong. Another example is in an article by Wingfield, and I think it's to get Maya, writing in the conversation, they speak of the structured disabilism affecting frontline healthcare workers in the United Kingdom, and they state, a number of healthcare workers have also developed long COVID, rendering them unable to work. Worryingly, some healthcare employers do not recognise COVID-19 as an occupational exposure. This curtails the access to financial protection of those affected. In some cases, this has cost employees their jobs, or, or, and force them to claim benefits. So 
other examples of disabilism that is more like an internal internalized disabilism that Carol Thomas um, uh, defines as psycho-emotional disabilism is evidenced in an article in The Age, which provides a first-person account of, of a mother of four, Mary Jane, who is struggling with the symptoms of ME-CFS. And Mary states, due to the mystery that shrouds CFS, I feel very isolated and often question my sanity because this does not conform to common illnesses. There is no known cause and no known cure except bed rest and an abundance of patience and hope. Similarly, an Australian woman, Kim Hurley, who contracted COVID-19 aboard the Ruby Princess in 2020, discusses in the Newcastle Herald the devastating effects the virus has had on her life and livelihood. She reports that due to significant um, uh, lack of energy, does not have a capacity for full-time work. Kim demonstrates the disabilism linked to contested illnesses and is reported as stating... And in the past 12 months, Miss Hurley has been told COVID-19 was a hoax, that it was a conspiracy, and that she just had a flu. I found that really invalidating, and I actually found it quite offensive, she said. When someone says you didn't have it, and it actually affected your life, and your life isn't what it was before, it is invalidating. So just in wrapping up, um, why this research is needed it's estimated that up to 250,000 Australians live with debilitating MECFS. It's also estimated that approximately 5 to 10% of people infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus in Australia may have long COVID. So thank you for listening um, and any questions or comments, uh, advice for my final year of my PhD would be most appreciated. And um, that's my email if anyone would like to get in touch. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kathy. Fantastic work. Now, uh, there's a few comments that I'll read out in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. While I'm doing that, Danielle Hitch, if you could please um, upload your presentation ready to share, please. So um, people have said in the chat, uh, okay. Kat says there's very, very, very influential cabal of psychiatrists that are responsible for setting these narratives about fatigue-related illness. And she links to these people. Uh, Lauren says, as someone who has lived with this for two plus years, I cannot tell you how heartening it is to hear it being spoken about in this way. I won't be able to listen to the entire seminar today because of spoons, but I'd like to know where I can email to get a copy of the recording to listen to as I am able. Uh, so, um, if you email me, everyone, um, just, uh, so when you registered, you probably will have seen my email, um, address, but if, if it wasn't on the registration as the organiser, then just Google me, you'll easily find my UNSW email online. Um, okay, I've just sort of lost access to the chat. Oh, here we go. Um, and many other thanks from people with long COVID for Kathy, really validating, really enjoying someone validating their experiences and, and Kathy's preliminary findings. Elizabeth says, hi, Kathy. just wondering also if you were looking how to contest some of these narratives. So, Kathy, would you like to answer that question? Uh, so so my, my thesis, um, ha I, I'm also been interviewing, um, so I'm, I'm looking at how knowledge is produced um, around these illnesses and how it affects people on the ground. So I have interviewed medical professionals as, as one cohort, um, and also lived experience through patients. Um, so, yes, I will be talking about the contestative narratives um, as I get through analysis of those interviews. This is just really a starter point to see how um, the media has characterised um, ME, CFS and long COVID. Uh, but, yes, I'll be looking at that as I 
go, go further into my analysis. Oh, um, it'd be fascinating to hear what the um, health professionals are saying, Kathy. I know that's not a topic for today, but yes, <laughs> very interesting. Um, Sarah, just last question here, because we're running out of time, but Sarah says, are academics researching the false characterization of MECFS and LC as psych psychosomatic banding together to do any kind of direct uh, advocacy or activism? Uh, I'm not sure if you're, you can answer that question. Um, uh, um, definitely the themes around um, contestations around the biopsychosocial model will be touched on in my thesis because that does come yeah. up a lot in the literature. Yeah, okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Cathy. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now we'll get on to Danielle Hitch and colleagues. Danielle, would you like to begin your presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm assuming everyone can see the slides okay. Um, yes. So my, <laughs> my name is Danny Hitch and I'm an Associate Professor in Occupational Therapy. My co-presenter today is Dr. Sarah Holton, who is a Senior Research Fellow in Nursing and Midwifery. Uh, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri and Wathaurong people on whose land this work was completed. And we pay our deep respects to the ancestors and elders of these nations, along with the traditional custodians of the lands from which you're all joining us today. And we'd also like to give a sincere thank you to Professor Lupton for pulling this all together. I'm sure it's taken a lot of hard work. So thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. So health equity and COVID-19 in Australia and around the world couldn't be a more critical or timely issue. As we're navigating through the pandemic, it's become increasingly clear that COVID-19 has not affected all Australians or all Australian communities equally. Vulnerable populations have faced disproportionate challenges, amplifying and compounding pre-existing health inequities in our society. This presentation is based on a study which aimed to identify and describe the socially and politically mediated determinants of health following COVID-19 infection. We also wanted to acknowledge that some of the determinants we talk about are politically rather than just socially mediated to highlight the opportunities we may have for positive change in the future. By exploring the lived experiences of Australians recovering from COVID-19, we've uncovered complex and interconnected relationships between multiple determinants of health. The COVID-19 pandemic has significantly exacerbated existing health disparities and highlighted stark inequalities within and across countries. I'm sure many of you would have listened to the public announcements during the first couple of years of the pandemic, where it was always presented as this person died from COVID, but they had pre-existing conditions. So flagging the fact that this person um, was more vulnerable, but not necessarily in a compassionate way. The pandemics underscored the urgent need for health and social strategies that prioritise equity and tackle the root causes of these disparities. Groups at greater vulnerability for poor outcomes from COVID-19 include people with disability, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, older people, Indigenous communities, the homeless and those living in poverty. These disparities are not just numbers, they represent real people facing significant barriers to health, wellbeing and access to care. It highlights the importance of engaging with lived experience of people recovering from, long, uh, from COVID or with long COVID to understand their lived experience and their personal uh, determinants of health because these are unique to all individuals. Australia's experience with the, long co with the COVID-19 pandemic has been unique due to its geographical isolation and strong public health responses, resulting in relatively low rates of COVID-19 related mortality and morbidity initially. However, the emergence of the Omicron variant led to a surge in cases, as we know, and increased public awareness of long COVID as a significant health issue. That's not to say that everyone has good awareness, but it, people are generally becoming more aware of long COVID. Estimates of long COVID prevalence in Australia range from 5 to 20 per cent, and its significant impacts are becoming more evident over time. So now I'll hand over to Sarah for our next slide. Thanks, Danny. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the framework that we used for the project. So we used the health equity framework um, and we adopted this as the organising theoretical structure for the qualitative, qualitative analysis of the multi-level determinants which are affecting health equity. 
um, or inequity experienced by the participants in the study. And this approach allowed us to explore not only just the physical and medical sequelae of non-COVID, but also the social, economic um, and emotional dimensions of the participants' lived experiences. And so the framework um, defines health equity as having the personal agency and fair access to resources and opportunities needed to achieve the best possible physical, emotional and social wellbeing. Conversely, health inequity, inequity is defined as the preventable differences in health outcomes closely linked to social, economical and environmental um, conditions. And the framework was developed to provide public health practitioners with a tool to help them identify the systemic roots of inequity and translate this into action or practice. And it's based on three core principles. And these are firstly putting equity at the core of health outcomes by emphasising personal agency and fair access to resources. Secondly, highlighting the multiple interacting spheres of influence. And thirdly, acknowledging that health equity and inequity results from the cumulative impact of experience over time. Thanks, Danny. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we used a narrative qualitative data collection method um, in which we asked participants to tell their own story of COVID-19 in their own time and their own words. We collected the data using semi-structured uh, interviews, which were completed either online or over the telephone. And the research was conducted at a large metropolitan public health service located in Melbourne, Australia. And the local community which this health service serves is characterised by um, socioeconomic disadvantage, cultural diversity, and is also experiencing rapid population growth. And the locality was considered a COVID um, hotspot during the pandemic and frequently recorded case numbers far above the statewide average. Most of the participants in the study were living in this community, but some were recruited from other Australian uh, communities. We sought to recruit uh, people with a who had a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19 um, from February 2020 to March 2022, and who were at least six months post their diagnosis, and they also needed to be 18 years or over. We excluded uh, participants if they required it interpret assistance due to uh, resource restrictions, but we acknowledge that this may have excluded um, some Australians who uh, experience some health inequities. However, the findings of this research have allowed the research team to um, secure some funding for other studies that we're currently undertaking, which include uh, resources for interpreters. The final sample that we had for this study included 57 people who had uh, experiences of lived and living experience of long COVID. And we set, um, determined the sample size using information power, and we weren't aiming to uh, get sa theoretical saturation. We know that the lived experiences of people with COVID-19 vary considerably between individuals, and we've tried to uh, honour that when we've re reported the findings. We used a priori uh, thematic analysis, which was undertaken independently by multiple uh, researchers within the team in order to enhance the rigour of the analysis. And we used a code book with predefined um, superordinate codes and their associated themes were derived from the, the health equity framework that we used. Thanks, Danny. No worries. So getting on to the findings, our findings underscore the importance of social support networks in the recovery or the living with long COVID process and highlight the need for targeted interventions to mitigate isolation and foster strong supportive networks. Relationships and networks played a pivotal role in shaping health outcomes. Robust social networks offering emotional and practical support during both the acute and post-acute phases of COVID-19 emerged as critical enablers of health equity in our data. These networks facilitate health promoting choices through mental health checkups, ensuring food availability at the very basic level, sharing coping strategies and providing companionship. The advent of social media and other online platforms have introduced a novel form of peer support, highlighting how these networks can thrive in both the real and virtual environment, provided there's access to internet, which not everyone has. However, isolation stands out as a significant barrier to health equity. A loss of friendships due to disbelief, stigma or political differences has led to increased isolation for some people, cutting individuals off from essential sources of support. This issue is particularly pronounced in disadvantaged communities where integration back into society post lockdown has been challenging due to heightened isolation or prolonged isolation in the case of Western Melbourne. Furthermore, participants noted that the fear of transmitting the virus led to voluntary withdrawal from social relationships, which, although sometimes temporary, could still have long-term negative impacts on health and well-being. 
We also found that systems of power emerged as a really critical theme in the data. Participants shared that established relationships with healthcare providers and employers significantly impacted their experiences in a positive way or potentially a negative way. Regular and meaningful communication with health professionals fostered a sense of support and care, highlighting the importance of these relationships in navigating the recovery journey. However, fear of virus transmission led to some being denied medical attention, including a lack of indicating a lack of provider knowledge in some cases. It's important to note that not all Australians have these pre-existing relationships with healthcare services or uh, social support services. Many people in Western Melbourne don't have a GP. The findings also emphasise the challenges faced by those navigating fragmented healthcare services, where the need to coordinate care across multiple specialties often led to confusion, a lack of continuity in care and exhaustion. Navigating multiple providers and systems took, takes a lot of time that participants don't necessarily have. Employment experiences varied greatly amongst the participants and those feeling supported by their employers reported better outcomes in returning to work. But this support wasn't universal and revealed a stark contrast in what people have available to them to get back into employment. The financial, social and personal aspects of people with long COVID lives have all been significantly impacted. Many people reported experiencing considerable financial hardship due to the inability to work, compounded by a lack of coverage by leave provisions. It was also particularly acute for those who were ineligible for government support, which led to drastic changes in living circumstances and greatly increased stress. Challenges in returning to work also placed additional strain, further exacerbating financial and emotional stress. The pressure to maintain jobs without adequate rest, without opportunities for adequate rest, uh, also highlighted systemic inequities in the workplace and government welfare systems. People also face challenges in engaging in meaningful activities and fulfilling their life roles, which are critical for individual identity and well-being. The focus is in the literature is often on the performance of self-care and domestic tasks but these aren't necessarily the areas of life most impacted upon by long COVID, particularly in people who have relatively mild or nuanced symptoms. Diminished ability to participate in community and social activities not only affected people's mental health, but exacerbated their social isolation. I'll hand over to Sarah. Sarah. Thanks, Danny. Um, so we also undertook a sub-analysis of the data based on gender, given its recognised impact of the COVID-19 experience. And we know that men are more likely to die of acute COVID-19, but women are more likely to be identified as having long COVID. And we found that the male participants in our study were reluctant to access and engage with healthcare for their long COVID-19 symptoms. With several describing how they just wanted to tough it out um, before going to the doctors. Significantly, the more women spoke about their experiences with systems of power and emotional responses. Some of, um, felt dismissed or gaslighted by healthcare providers and employers, um, which often left them feeling frustrated and disempowered. They frequently assumed that their symptoms would be dismissed to their gender because of their gender, and um, were appreciative when healthcare providers were actually willing to investigate, to you know, take the time to investigate their symptoms instead of just attributing them to their um, being a hormonal woman. Women were also more likely to be caring for others, such as children or elderly parents, and the impact of their long COVID-19 symptoms therefore extended to other people in their family, as they were often unable to fulfil their previous care carer roles. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. So our final um, findings to report is about 28% of the participants developed new conditions or symptoms in the months following their recovery, but 19% of our participants found their pre-existing health conditions were exacerbated by COVID-19 infection, leading to increased reliance on medications and treatments um, they previously used less often. Fatigue, breathlessness, cardiovascular issues and mental health concerns were the most challenging symptoms reported by our participants, with fatigue and breathlessness in particular having a pervasive impact on all areas of daily life, making basic activities like having a shower or washing your hair a real struggle. For some participants, these symptoms were particularly distressing because they were similar to experiences of choking or drowning, which were their greatest fears. The interconnected nature of physiological and mental health symptoms emphasises the complexity of the recovery process and underscores the need for a holistic approach to health equity in the context of COVID-19. So in conclusion, social support systems are important. Systems of power are a key influence 
Financial hardship and the loss of valued life roles are a common and really distressing long COVID experience. Gender and potentially other personal factors shape the lived experience of people with long COVID. Long COVID impacts on every aspect of health and wellbeing. So for health equity, we need targeted interventions to decrease isolation and build or maintain people's social networks, systemic policies and practices that leverage existing supports and improve system navigability for everybody, action on financial support for people with long COVID, interventions and supports that maximise participation in Australian life for people for long COVID, policies, practices and interventions that are sensitive and responsive to elements of personal identity and intersectionality. We need to include exacerbation of pre-existing conditions in definitions of long COVID. If we don't, then we're missing a large proportion of people whose lives have been impacted by the virus. And overall, we need to have a holistic approach to care and support that sees the whole person, not just their long COVID. Thank you. Thanks very much, Danny and colleagues. Any questions for this team of researchers? They've got a lot of very rich findings they've reported. Um, and just while people are getting their questions happening, just pop them in the chat, please, if you have a question. Um, Laurie and Kate, if you could uh, get your presentation ready to share. Oh, yeah, very good. All right. I can see your presentation, Laurie and Kate. So um, questions for the current study. anyone here with long COVID um, on this call, on this meeting, um, feel like the findings from this study chime with their findings or are different in any way, given that it was a very interesting, if you remember, it's a very interesting population that these researchers um, spoke to, very marginalised, disadvantaged, ethnically diverse population. So be interesting to compare those findings with other people's research or other people's experiences. Uh, yes, so we're getting some people saying yes. Okay, well, that's, I guess that's very validating for these that's researchers. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, well, I guess, I, I, I mean, I am super, in, oh, hang on, there's someone else, yep. Oh, someone else has asked a question, Lou. One thing that I wondered about was about with the top worst symptoms, was post-exertional malaise or symptoms worsening? Yeah, that was mentioned by a lot of people as well, um, particularly with those trying to do daily activities and trying to manage uh, you know, the small amount of energy people had over time and how it fluctuates, and it can be really difficult to predict what people can do day to day. Yeah. Um, people have commented again, yes, the BIPOC, which is the sort of cold equivalent in the UK, culturally in the most communities tend not to be in the advocacy world. Yeah, I've noticed that yeah. myself too. They often don't get a voice um, for, yeah. for obviously lots of different reasons to do with power and access to information technologies and access to, um, I guess, linguistic, you know, the dominant language of the country they live in and so on. Um, mm. And just in relation to that, actually, Danny, um, did you find when you were talking to these people, I mean, in terms of how they felt they were able to get a voice in terms of their experiences of long COVID, were, were there any positive reflections from your participants about any kind of ways that coming from cold communities saying was there any anyone from a community who felt like they their community leaders was were helping them in getting access to support and medical care or anything no, like that? No, but we did have some we did have not really, but we did have some interesting um, stuff that we're following up in the project we're doing at the moment, which is focusing on women from core backgrounds about um, cultural approaches to managing long COVID. Um, but really we at that point people were saying they were pretty much completely shut out. Everyone was completely shut out. Mm. But there were some mm. really interesting um, comments from people who were sort of aware of the fact that they did have a voice because they were 
they're relatively well resourced or educated or whatever and knowing that there are a huge amount of people with long COVID who would remain voiceless to this day so we're trying very hard to overcome that. Oh that's really interesting yeah looking forward to seeing what you do there. Um, Jordan you. has a question about the 28% of new symptoms etc assuming the other 72% all had symptoms too I'm not clear on what the differentiating factors are. Yeah, so in our, because this was started before the um, case definition came out, so there were people in our sample, a smaller, small proportion of our sample had recovered within three months. So it was about COVID recovery at that point. But the majority of people had what would be termed long COVID now that um, who's put that three months timeline. But so they all had symptoms following uh, their COVID infection that lasted more than, you know, a couple of weeks. But that the people who developed new symptoms, a lot of people were talking about developing new allergies, uh, new asthma, um, tinnitus came up quite a lot and incontinence came up quite a lot, which you don't see a lot in the um, literature, especially for young women. Mm. Um, and just finally, it was more of a comment. Um, apologies if I've missed it. What do we know about the, what's the question too? Uh, impacts on experiences of First Nations population, very, very important, of course. Um, did you have yeah. any First Nations people in your study? Not, unfortunately, not in this, but we do have an Aboriginal health unit at Western Health. So we're looking at ways forward that we can um, work with those communities oh. as well. Excellent. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much, Danny and team. Thank you very um, much. We'll now move on to Laurie and Kate from La Trobe University. Thanks, Laurie and Kate. Take it away. Uh, thanks, Deborah. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here today at this fantastic uh, conference. Uh, our paper is on uh, long COVID coverage in the conversation. And uh, this is just from our abstract that there's relatively little still established about long COVID. Media coverage uh, has been sporadic and in many cases inadequate. So we're looking at a subset of... <clears throat> the coverage in the media by examining the thematic treatment of long COVID by academic experts in the conversation, where there's around 124 articles uh, that we sourced with the long COVID or long COVID-19 tags across the global network of editions. And uh, here's a couple of uh, definitions from articles, and I think it's still the case the dial hasn't shifted all that much from uh, the 2021 example up the top, there's still no standard definition. Of course, much more is known about aspects of the syndrome now than a few years ago, but it's been quite a stubborn condition in terms of still being reasonably enigmatic uh, compared to a lot of uh, other conditions. Um, all the more reason uh, to address it and to see what, what we're going through collectively um, because of long COVID and the long COVID inquiry report, which was um, recently released from the Australian Parliament, pointed to the impact of long COVID extending outside of medical settings with consequences, not just for the people with long COVID, but for the workforce and the economy uh, as well. Um, I just mentioned a, a lot of people as a, a find the media coverage inadequate in the States. This is um, an article in uh, Neiman Journalism Lab about the recent launch of uh, an online publication called The Six Sick Times to um, address overlooked perspectives from uh, COVID long haulers. And um, so it, I think that heightens the, uh, the, the case for examining how the conversation itself is actually examining uh, long COVID. So this is what happens when you uh, click the long COVID tag and um, you get, uh, as I mentioned before, a, a, a bit over 120 articles that have been published since 2020. I'll, I'll jump through some of the literature on the conversation and its COVID uh, coverage. I'll just draw attention here to um, a book chapter by Hamida and others on coverage in the Conversations Canadian edition, uh, which point to um, the, uh, the the articles appearing across all site sections, not only health and science, but also politics, business, culture, arts, education, et cetera. 
and that uh, COVID-19 articles covered critical race issues, including anti-Asian racism and the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on racialized communities. Another interesting thing about the coverage when we look at um, this particular panel on the, the COVID-19, uh, sorry, the long COVID sort of homepage is how interdiscipline, how, how it's an example uh, COVID of the extent to which uh, or it's an example of interdisciplinarity writ large, like that other wicked problem, climate change. And so our research questions seek to establish in part uh, how, to what extent the coverage in long co of long COVID in the conversation has an interdisciplinary dimension. You can see other, our other research questions up there. What are the main characteristics of the articles? How frequently are they published over time? What are the main themes of the coverage? Where are the authors geographically placed? And what's the disciplinary expertise of authors? How is it covered by uh, interdisciplinary researchers and teams? So I hand you now to Kate. Thanks, Laurie. Um, and thanks, Deborah, for organising this symposium. Um, so I will run over uh, maybe some just numbers and general bits and pieces, but I promise we'll get juicy again in a minute. Um, but essentially, we looked at articles that were tagged with long COVID or the less common tag, long COVID-19. Uh, all of these articles were published in English and available on the Australian edition of the conversation. However, we did find that the same collection of articles appeared in the global um, and like in other editions. Um, uh, yeah, so it returned 124 articles between the 16th of July 2020 and the 23rd of January 2024. Uh, once I looked at those articles, it turns out that only 113 were actually about long COVID. So there were a few that were potentially mistagged. Um, and while 113 articles might seem like a substantial number, when you compare it to the almost 8,000 articles that were tagged with COVID-19, um, it's quite a small fraction of the coverage on the conversation. Uh, we analysed both the metadata, um, including information on authors and the content of the articles, um, to look at where the researchers were from geographically and in terms of disciplines, as well as to what extent non-health disciplines were represented. Um, and looking at the main characteristics of the articles, we found that uh, maybe Laurie, could you jump back one slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we found that within the 113 articles, there were only 83 that were primarily focused on long COVID. So there were a handful of articles that only briefly referred to long COVID. So that might have been one or two sentences or a single mention. Um, and then a handful of articles that referred to long COVID within the context of other subject matter, which was typically um, COVID-19 at large. Um, over time, we saw that, uh, sorry, back to that other article. Thank you. Um, yeah, we saw that uh, coverage did increase in 2021 and 2022 and then sort of plateaued out. Um, so there was a surge in coverage of long COVID, uh, but it seemed to have plateaued last year. Um, yeah, thanks, Laurie. Um, so in terms of the articles themselves, there were... Uh, article, there was a, sorry, a mix of both original research and synthesis or interpretation of research more broadly. Um, the majority was in terms, uh, was like research interpretation or translation. Um, but interestingly, there were two instances of authors speaking of their own lived experience of long COVID within the context of other research or used that to, um, like to, to, to translate or communicate the, the point of other research. Um, but yeah, that would be two of 113, so it's quite small. Um, there were seven articles that referred to preprint material, an additional two that referred to planned or prospective studies, and four that referred to non-peer-reviewed articles. Um, Laurie will mention the the influence of the unknown or uncertainty later on, but I, I guess like the um, the way that non-peer reviewed and planned or prospective studies were 
involved sort of really like highlights the way that people were talking about uncertainties in this coverage. Um, in terms of the main themes, we saw uh, quite a predominant influence of uh, health related content. Um, the top themes were around the risk and prevention of long COVID, the treatment of long COVID, health impacts to a patient or a person who had long COVID, um, and then policy and healthcare systems at large. There was quite little focus on disability, stigma, lived experience, or the consequences of long COVID on employment. Um, and it's really interesting to hear everyone talk about all of those social impacts and the lived experience of long COVID earlier, because that really hasn't come through in media coverage on the conversation as much as health impacts at large. Um, there were also very few articles that focused on underrepresented or minority populations, um, but that was increasing over time or references and acknowledgement of the impacts of long COVID um, on those populations has started to occur more frequently more recently. Um, so in terms of geography, we did see an overwhelming preference for the Anglosphere, um, which is unsurprising given that we were looking at articles published in English that were available on the Australian edition. Um, there was also only one article that was a multinational team where there were uh, team members from the US as well as from Mexico. So the majority of articles were from the Anglosphere and also from one nation, I suppose. Or, um, and then... Oh, I think maybe a, there's a slide back one. Beautiful. Thanks, Laurie. Um, so in terms of the disciplinary expertise of authors and multi-author teams as well, um, we looked at the self-described disciplines of articles and coded them into these four categories. Um, these categories only tell us part of the story for there were also many articles that were authored by teams rather than individuals. Um, and those teams offered interdisciplinary expertise, um, but also many authors classified themselves as multidisciplinary. And here is one example. So Faso, as you can see, describes herself as having multidisciplinary research expertise and covers quite a few different disciplines. Um, and then to the next slide, Laurie. Uh, yeah, so looking at the way um, that articles were, sorry, the number of articles that were multi-authored and interdisciplinary. Um, there was a substantial increase in articles that were both multi-authored and interdisciplinary over time. Um, so, for example, in 2021, six of 28 articles or 21 percent were authored by interdisciplinary teams. Um, and then in 2023, it was far more prevalent at 44% or 16 of 36 articles. Um, Laurie will now talk to a few of those examples. Uh, thanks, Kate. So I just want to draw attention briefly to some of the articles uh, where we see interdisciplinary teams and the what they're bringing um, into into play. And my, as noted, a lot of these articles are really popping up over the last year. In this particular one, uh, we've got uh, sociologists, social scientists, health scientists. I think there's another author there we can't see as well. Um, if we look at uh, this particular article, Nisreen R1 is actually one of the more prolific contributors uh, to articles, to the conversation articles on long COVID. And uh, in, in this instance here, she's a professor of public health. She's working um, with, a, with a statistician and PhD candidate to actually look at um, some of the issues. This is a kind of really interdisciplinary project looking at some of the background to uh, why so many people in the UK are out of work due to long COVID. And uh, we here's one of the examples that's um, very recent of a very interdisciplinary team, largely from RMIT, uh, spanning everything from marketing to biomedical sciences to immunology, which is uh, analysing what a, a group of long haulers uh, that they followed for three months have told them about living with long COVID. Um, so just to, uh, to sort of summarise, 
while there's fluctuations in terms of estimates of how many people have long COVID or will get it, there's broad agreement, broad agreement in all the articles across the conversation. Long COVID's a post-viral condition. It manifests itself in different ways with much still to be understood. None of the articles suggested long COVID wasn't real, in contrast to the scepticism about the condition when it first emerged as a social media advocacy movement in the US. There's no hype here about breakthrough treatments. Um, there's uh, There are articles, I think, including one from Deborah, on some of the uh, highly touted um, uh, fake uh, or unproven treatments that were getting media coverage. And there's one kind of one, we got it wrong article about coverage, which really just says that the scale of long COVID was underestimated. Uh, just some limitations of what we've done so far. We can't really, and we haven't tried to infer editorial policies, uh, preferencing different types of articles and expertise. Um, from the conversation. We can't determine also, obviously, if our findings reflect the actual scale of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary research um, in, in, into long COVID from this. And we've only just begun to work with um, Meltwater, which is a social listening platform to determine uh, which of these articles had the most impact and republication. Uh, but to conclude with a really quick discussion here, we conclude the conversation is continuing to share and provide regular engagement with what's known and what's being researched. Uh, well, relatively few articles have focused on some of the social and economic contexts. Uh, there is an increase of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research over time that's bringing those themes to the fore. And uh, we find also that coverage uh, that we referred to earlier in the Canadian edition of the conversation on COVID in general in 2020, came up with broadly the same main things we found in its international coverage of long COVID. So um, we feel that um, the, the conversation uh, from this, we can see is providing a net platform to examine various disciplinary strands that are deployed to address COVID long COVID-19, to provide useful expertise to citizens. And that this is particularly important given the perceived lack of information by many experiencing long COVID and for all sectors of society who continue to grapple with its consequences. Thanks. Thanks, Laurie and Kate. Um, so while we're having a conversation about their findings, um, Marisol and Juana um, are the next speakers. If you could get your presentation ready, please. Um, so I would, yeah, just in relation to the conversation, I would um, strongly suggest that all the fabulous researchers presenting their findings today. Um, see if they can pick, pick something in the conversation and get the discussion happening in the conversation about their fantastic findings. It's really worthwhile, and as Laurie and Kate have just shown, um, you know, there's it's in, there haven't been that many conversation articles about long COVID, and so we need to hear more, particularly about this new and emerging research um, findings from people who are presenting here today. So there was a um, comment Lou has said, a related angle for research could be to look at the Australian New Zealand Science Media Centre's coverage of long COVID. Also the SciMEX website, Science Media Exchange, which highlights research to journalists in Australia and New Zealand. What do you say about that, Laurie and Kate? Oh, uh, great. I, did, I didn't know about that. So thanks for the tip. <laughs> That's really great. Okay. Um, I mean, would be really interesting to know, wouldn't it? Just, I don't know if there's been any media research done on audience or readership responses to conversa the conversation articles across whatever topic they cover, because they topic many, many uh, topics. Do you know, has there been sort of any research looking at just how the conversation is read and received by audiences? Uh, okay. no, not, to, not to my knowledge in, in terms of what do people actually think of it, surveys of what people think about its coverage of particular issues. There's been a lot of attention on republication and social media um, sharing and those kinds of things, but I think that's slightly different to taking up the question as to 
how people evaluate the knowledge. So I'd love to be proved wrong on this, but I, I haven't seen anything in the literature on that so far. No, no, I haven't either. And there's some, I've written about 25 articles now for the yeah. conversation, so I personally would be... You're, you're, very, you're very unusual, Deborah. I mean, one striking thing about the coverage, and I guess about communication and media studies in general, is how little uh, focus there's been on media coverage of long COVID by media and com communication scholars. A lot of it's been public health um, right from the get-go from 2020, 2021, when articles started to appear in journals. So uh, it's an under-researched area. Yeah. Yeah, and I just, as an author, I'd be interested to know just, yeah, what the, because, I mean, one big selling point, maybe the big selling point, of course, of the conversation in this sort of context of rampant misinformation and disinformation and conspiracy theories and um, lack of trust in science and so on that we can see in the, in the, among sections of the general public is that the conversation, as we know, you know, is only, um, uh, the articles are written only by academic researchers and for the most part we are still highly trusted by the community although there is a less and less trust in science but um it is the one of the few media outlets you know where it isn't the, the articles aren't written by journalists they are written by actual academic researchers so yeah it'd be interesting to know just what the public how much the public values that um just looking at some other questions. Um, Jordan says, when looking at risk and prevention, do you have a breakdown of what was recommended in these articles? Uh, we don't. Uh, we can we, we probably can we've probably got preliminary data on how many did provide that. Um, that's a kind of genre of the conversation in general that uh, which I think a lot of those are commissioned, like what should you do? Um, that's certainly been a finding, I think, in the Canadian research on the conversations coverage of COVID-19 in Canada. But um, I think it would be an interesting thing for us to take up uh, when, as we prepare to publish. So thanks. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and we're still, working, we're still working on the number of times the articles were read. We're just experimenting with the new platform for that at the moment. Thanks. Oh, so Kate asked a question, but Kate has actually answered it in the chat. <laughs> so I won't, uh, re people can check that out in the chat. Um, and Sue says, we try to get the patient community findings in the, in the conversation, but you need to be filled out, yes, with the university. That's correct, Sue. Um, so what you can do as an academic researcher or a member of the community is get an academic researcher to work with you to write it. And, and what we're allowed to do is acknowledge the contributions, but we can't have you as co-authors, unfortunately. But we, we can we can acknowledge you at the bottom of the article. So at least that's one way of acknowledging your import from the community. Um, but I agree, it would be good to recognise patient-led research more, and, you know, as you say, so many of you do have um, research training. So absolutely. So I would just say hop on with an academic researcher and um, at least you will get acknowledged. You can, we can actually name people, specific people that have contributed to the article at the bottom of the article. And that's just one way to do it. Um, Lou says, following on from Deborah's question, also data on the re republishing of convo pieces would be great. In New Zealand, good data because they're often republished in the main media outlets. Yes, that's true. I've sometimes opened my local city newspaper to find one of my articles republished there, which is a nice surprise. Um, are you looking at that, um, Laurie and Kate, are you looking at where these long COVID articles are republished in other outlets? Yeah, we'll be able to do that with the data, with the platform that's available to us. And there's probably a second way to do that as well. So, um, and just, you're, you're right. I mean, um, when I get my Google News alerts with articles that appear in the conversation, they usually come with... Um, you know, it's also being published in The Guardian or in, by ABC or whatever. So I think that's a really um, important way to evaluate um, the true value and spread of uh, and reach of the articles that are published first in the conversation. 
Yeah, so there's another question too about that from Nancy. Do you have access to how many times these articles were clicked on or read? I know as authors we do, but yeah. do you, are you, are other people able to see that if you're not an author, Laurie? Uh, no, I don't, well, you can't see, you can't see, uh, I don't think you can see how many times something's read. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows for sure, and they see the actual author and they provide, the conversation provides a lot of data on who's read your articles to individual academics, but um, it doesn't really do that in terms of showing which articles were the most popular, I think, on the site. No. So, I mean, what I guess what you could do if you're interested is, is contact authors and ask them to share those details with you. Yeah. Um, but anyway, but th thanks, everyone, and thanks, Lauren Kate. But we'll have to move on to the next presentation which is from researchers in Northwest Mexico. Um, so Marisol, I'm not sure if you're presenting it together, Marisol and Juana, but um, go ahead, who's ever presenting, please. Hello, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Marisol. I'm a PhD research candidate from the Food and Development Research Center in Hermosillo, Mexico. And today I'm presenting you the results of, of our original investigation uh, entitled Unveiling the Social Health Effects of Long COVID in Adult Population in Northwestern Mexico. Thank you for organizing this, Professor. Due to the international variety of viewers, I would like to start by giving context regarding the dates of when positive cases began in Mexico. The first case was in Mexico City in February 2020. In Sonora, the state where this research was carried out was in March of the same year. The next day, the government announced a national lockdown which lasted until September 2021 when 48% of the population was vaccinated. In May 2022, the mandatory use of face masks was revoked, and a year later, the government announced that the, pand that the pandemic was over. Sonora is located in the northwestern part of Mexico and borders the southern border of Arizona, the United States. Sonora has almost 3 million inhabitants, which almost 90% live in urban areas. Regarding sex, the prevalence is equitable between men and women. Its capital is Hermosillo, and the prevalence of health conditions in Sonora is higher compared to the rest of the country. These conditions were comorbidities for COVID-19. The aim of this research was to identify the social and health implications in adults living in Sonora, Mexico, who presented long COVID. An online survey was conducted using the Cobo Toolbox website, and it was targeted for people older than 18 years living in Sonora. It was open from December 18 from last year to January 2022 20, of the present year. For the analysis, we use the IBM SPSS statistics version 25. Our survey was made up of six sections with a total of 53 questions. For the analysis, we formed two groups, one with people who report having long COVID symptoms and the other without. We used the Man Whitney U test for this analysis. A second analysis was carried out with the long COVID group, but, but now by age group. For this, we used the Kruskal Wallis test. Our results. Initially, 400 people answered the survey, of which 37% report not having ever been infected with COVID-19, so these were discarded. Of the people who did report having been infected, 31 were ruled out because they were from other regions, they were not from Sonora, leaving us with a total sample of 221 people. Of the total sample, 52% report having long COVID symptoms and the rest don't. So these are the two groups for the analysis. We asked our participants for their pre-existing health conditions before 2019, 
and the prevalence of pre-existing health conditions was higher in the long COVID group, as we can see in this graphic. In both groups, the majority of the participants were women. Most are married people. Most have a high level of education and a middle income. In, in both groups, the, um, more than 40% were infected for the first time during the mandatory lockdown. And even if the difference is not significant, the prevalence of unvaccinated people uh, is twice as high in the long COVID group. Here we can observe the number of infections within each group with a statistical significance. Just over 40% of the people who present long COVID symptoms were infected more than once compared to 30% of people without long COVID. Also, a significant difference was found in the severity of the disease. It can be observed that in both groups, the severity of COVID-19 was mild to moderate. However, even if the COVID symptoms were mild, infection can result in a series of prolonged symptoms, as we can see in the next table. 15 prolonged symptoms and the emergence of new diseases were reported. Among the most frequent symptoms were fatigue, anxiety, and lack of concentration. The total exceeds the uh, 100% since there were people who report having more than one symptom, as we can see in the next table. More than 70% of, uh, of, the, of the people with long COVID have between one and two symptoms. However, there were participants who report having up to 11 symptoms. Here, we can observe that people who present one sequel experience a milder COVID, people with two sequels and uh, between mild to moderate COVID, people with three sequels uh, more of a moderate COVID, and people with more than four sequels presented a more moderate to severe COVID with a statistical significance between the number of sequels. We also um, asked the, uh, about their changes in their healthy lifestyle practices. And regarding the, their diet, in both groups, the majority did not present changes in, in their diet. And there were a high percentage of people who improved their diet. No significant difference were found between both groups. When, ana when analyzing by age group in the long COVID participants, we found that the group that was most affected in their diet were the youngest. Regarding changes in their physical activity, significant difference were found between both groups. It can be observed that 40% of people with long COVID decreased their physical activity. No significant difference were found among the age group in, within the long COVID group regarding physical activity. We also listed uh, 18 social emotional situations in which participants had to choose the ones they agreed on. Overall, both groups care more about their health and their family. Also, significant difference were found between the groups in five situations. People with long COVID are more distressed about having a family member getting sick. They're more afraid and anxious about being around crowds. They give less priority to their work. They feel uncertain about their future. And they are more afraid and anxious about physical contact comparing to the group that doesn't present long COVID. When analyzing by age group in the long COVID participants, we found that the group most affected on a social level were the youngest. So, so to sum this up, in this exploratory research, people with long COVID had a priority of long-term symptoms, 
um, the, they were infected more times with, with COVID-19 with major severity. Among the most common symptoms were fatigue, anxiety, and lack of concentration. The number of sequels and the COVID-19 severity were related. Uh, regarding changes in their healthy lifestyle practices within the whole group, the among the whole um, long COVID group, their physical activity decreased and their diet improved, and the diet worsened mostly in the younger group. An increase in the importance for mental and physical health and family time was observed. And the social impact was related to fear and anxiety of being around crowds and physical contact, a sense of uncertainty about their future, and they give less priority to their work. Among the youngest, they were more affected around socializing. This research isn't without limitations. Since the participants were selected via a web-based strategy, strategy which pertains a selection bias with implications on the generalizability of the findings. However, this exploratory research will serve as a base for future studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisol. Just while people are coming up with some questions for you, um, Pantia is the next presenter. So Pantia, please get your presentation ready. Ah, there you are, very quickly, thank you. So questions for Marisol and Juana on their Mexican study. Um, okay, let's have a look. I want, Mel says, I wonder how many that list anxiety as a symptom actually have postural tachycardia. So often this is misinterpreted as anxiety. Uh, well, it's a bit tricky to answer that one, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, it is. It's more of a comment because I guess you're not really. Did 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 just but did you ask people about postural tachycardia? Yes, yes, we listed. Uh, we had a long list of several symptoms, and we also had the option of to answer other in case one wasn't among the list. Yeah, it's a good good interesting question. Probably would require a fair bit of medical knowledge to tease that one out um and sarah says interesting to hear that diet doesn't make a significant change to symptoms we always hear from doctors what about your diet i would say the majority of us make intentional healthy lifestyle choices but the result is it limited i hope i've interpreted this correctly so that was that was your finding marisol that diet didn't make a significant change to symptoms right yeah, they, there wasn't a difference among the people that present long COVID and the ones that doesn't. Uh, most of them remain the same diet and there was even an improvement on their diet. But when analyzing only the, the people with long COVID, um, the people who got their diet got uh, worse was among the youngest, but it wasn't a, a high percentage. You didn't really, you didn't specifically ask them though if any changes to diet had improved their symptoms though, did you? Sorry again? You, you didn't, did you ask them whether any, they'd made any changes to their diet that had actually improved their symptoms? No, no, no. it was only if they changed, uh, made changes in their diet just like after COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I do. I mean, it's interesting. I do know that a lot of people with long COVID, for example, have changed their diet to try and improve their symptoms and also take a lot of supplements and things. So um, that might be something for others to to look at to, in future research. Um, Jordan asks, what do you find to be the most uh, significant finding from your research? If you were going to choose one, what would you really highlight, um, Marisol? Oh, wow. <laughs> for, <laughs> for me, it was very interesting to see that there were people having up to 11 symptoms. I cannot imagine li living like um, with that so many uh, consequences on my physical health. Mm. For me, that was a very interesting um, uh, result. 
Penny asked, what do you think the effect of a purely online survey was? You pointed out that this was a one of your limitations, the fact that it was only online. Was that a limitation as opposed to delivered in person? I think that's what she's asking. Right. Um, yeah, well, because uh, this, the um, the results cannot be general for the population. Uh, there is a lot of people in Mexico that doesn't have access to internet. So of course, uh, that amount of people get ex excluded from this kind of um, research tool. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Um, did uh, Catherine ask, did you possibly uh, explore further regarding fear related fear related to crowds and also physical contact. I wonder if this is related to concern about reinfection. Is there any sense that that's why people were worried about being in crowded situations? Marcel? Uh, do you... Well, I can only assume, like, um, these uh, results can um, serve as a base for these kind of concerns, uh, maybe this can be explored in like in interviews to see what's happening with these people. Why do they feel afraid of being with uh, other people or physical contact? But we can only assume for now that that can be a concern, the reinfection. Okay, and we've got time for just one last question, and I think this is a, actually a good one. Uh, not that the others aren't, but this might be a good one to end on. How do your findings, summarised on the third last slide, compare to other studies? So perhaps studies done either in Mexico or in sort of equivalent countries. Um, have there been studies that you can compare your findings with, Marisol? Uh, when I was um, doing the research to to do the survey, I found a lot of, a lot of research uh, like in the medical health field, um, in the social um, science uh, in Mexico. I didn't find, so um, I hope this can serve as a um, base for more people to get interesting in. Uh, researching what is happening in the social sphere. Yes, uh, and also it's great that there's work done with non-English speaking populations as well, because yes, it is mostly dominated as far as I can tell <clears throat> by the Anglophone sphere. So thanks very much, Marisol. Thank you. Um, we'll now move on to Pantia Javadan. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Pantia. <laughs> Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Um, from Stanford University in the USA. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, my name is Pontea Javidan, and I'm coming at you from unceded Ohlone land at Stanford University, um, presenting my paper on the profound societal impacts of long COVID and non-interventionism. And let's see if I can click through here. Okay, great. Um, so my paper is interested in uh, understanding the effects of long COVID on societal structures, especially education and employment with a focus on cognitive, psychiatric and psychosocial challenges. Um, and underwriting this is a critique of policies of non-intervention or laissez-faire um, originating in libertarian ideology, uh, because it's known to neglect and worsen health disparities by prioritizing short-sighted economic gains over public welfare. But ironically, this harms economic prosperity and workforce sustainability, and of course, amplifies social inequality. I use the social determinants of health framework to understand systemic inequities in the context of public health policy. And this reveals the need for policy shifts toward health equity and warns against the anti-democratic tendencies of non-interventionism that neglect public interest and deepen social disparities. And I argue that the social contract is being rewritten without the informed consent of the public, which erodes trust in government and social societal cohesion. 
I'm highlighting the dire consequences of non-intervention in this paper, including the neglect of long COVID patients who are harbingers of broader societal impacts. And I urge reevaluation of public health policies to uphold individual and population well-being and socioeconomic stability. So this is very much a work in progress at this point um, and largely serves at, at this stage to survey the damage that's being done um, since the turn towards non-interventionism. And so I won't go through all of the different sequelae of long COVID because I know this audience has a fair grasp of these, but essentially it's the chronic phase of COVID and, um, and the symptoms tend to persist for months, um, if not years and, and perhaps even lifetimes. And so um, I really focus a lot on the neurological and psychiatric impacts in this paper. Um, and these effects uh, of long COVID include depression, anxiety, and cognitive impairments. And these demand comprehensive care approaches, early intervention, ongoing screening, and integrated care, which is beyond the capacity of healthcare systems that are under strain. Um, studies are showing a high prevalence of psychiatric conditions, about 50% among COVID survivors, with significant long-term effects on quality of life. And on the other hand, studies show that having workplace and school mitigations have shown positive effects on mental health of workers and students. So looking at the global prevalence of long COVID, it's a serious but underappreciated problem of global public health affecting a substantial percentage of the world population, including young people, with consequences for health systems and societal functioning. Long COVID is underreported, uh, but studies show a global pooled prevalence of 49% with remarkably high rates in specific regions like the Eastern Mediterranean, which shows above 60% prevalence, with the lowest prevalence being in Southeast Asia. We have studies showing substantial numbers of sufferers in the UK, in Mexico, in Southern Brazil, Turkey, and many other countries at this point in the pandemic. And with incomplete protection from vaccines and inadequate mitigations from infection, the burden of long COVID is increasing across the world. So zooming in on the U.S., um, up to February 2022, about 7% of adults or approximately 23 million people reported uh, persistent long COVID symptoms uh, with about a quarter unable to work. Um, recent data indicate a prevalence of 5.3% in adults and 1.3% in U.S. children, with notable disparities among demographics, including, for example, a staggering 62% prevalence among California migrant farm workers, when 83% of U.S. farm workers are Hispanic. Uh, so current census data is actually showing uh, nearly 18% of US adults have ever had long COVID. Long COVID has led to significant health, economic and societal challenges, contributing to a substantial number of unfilled jobs and an estimated $3.7 trillion of economic cost over five years. Um, despite its impact though, uh, there's a noted decrease in research funding and physician confidence in diagnosing and treating the condition. And when we look at pediatric long COVID, we find um, that indeed long COVID does, in, does afflict children with a pooled prevalence of 23.36% in recent studies, um, systematic reviews, which substantially affects health, education, and future employability. With symptoms persisting for months and only notably decreasing after a year, children face disrupted learning, diminished academic performance, and strained psychosocial development. Specific populations of children, such as those over 10 years of age or with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, are at heightened risk. Rather than dedicating resources, though, to safeguarding children's health and education, governments are doing little to nothing to prevent transmission in schools and thereby 
protect children from long COVID. And the macroeconomic impact of long COVID is also profound. Of the uh, 250 million infected members of the workforce in the WHO's European region, 10 to 20% experience lingering symptoms. In the US, long COVID accounts for up to 15% of job vacancies with an estimated annual loss of $170 billion in wages, affecting around 4 million workers. This level of disablement um, has exacerbated labor shortages and reduced productivity, um, contributing significantly to a persistent labor gap despite high demand for labor um, and causing income loss and increased health care costs as well. Um, and understandably, the fear of COVID and its long term effects um, are deterring people from returning to in-person workplaces um, and so increasing part-time work and also unemployment uh, among uh, long COVID sufferers in particular. And um, this emphasizes a really critical need for international cooperation to improve long COVID management and integrate patient um, experiences into research and treatment strategies and so forth. Um, and in terms of the broad socioeconomic impacts, um, some employers um, are responding by offering more flexible work conditions and better disability accommodations. Um, but amidst tensions between uh, business operations and the individual needs of employees with long COVID, uh, disability and labor rights are increasingly important in the U.S. context in particular, where we have really stark socioeconomic inequities, um, with about 24% of civilian workers or roughly 33.6 million Americans uh, lacking access to paid sick leave. Um, this gap in worker protections disproportionately affects lower income workers. Um, only 51% in the lowest earnings quartile have paid sick leave. Um, among the lowest earning 10th, only 31% have access compared to 92% in the highest. So these disparities are particularly pronounced among lower wage service workers and point to systemic problems that increase financial instability risks for the most vulnerable, um, especially those afflicted with long COVID or other chronic conditions. But we should really bear in mind um, that half of Americans suffer from a chronic disorder such as diabetes or hypertension or prediabetes, and more than two thirds of the population is overweight or obese, which puts them at risk. And so that brings me to um, the ongoing policy failures in response. All of this shows an urgent need for policies ensuring that all workers have equitable health and financial protections across incomes and occupations, but instead, the CDC just eliminated its guidance for COVID isolation. Um, workers, especially those in lower income and service jobs without paid sick leave, now face the choice between their health and financial stability um, even more so and are encouraged to work while contagious, which increases virus transmission risks for all. Um, for those with long COVID, the lack of isolation requirements without sufficient sick leave protections threatens the worst health outcomes and prolonged recovery periods. Um, the situation is really calling for comprehensive sick leave policies to protect all workers rather than public health guidelines that penalize the most vulnerable in these ways. Looking at education and youth impacts, um, COVID is straining the U.S. education system with nearly half of public schools reporting vacancies by early 2022, affecting key teaching roles and leading to larger class sizes and reduced services. Um, efforts to counteract this, like raising wages, um, are often not sustained over time. And so um, going back to that 23% uh, prevalence rate, um, this is a substantial risk that most parents would not have taken had they known about pediatric long COVID. Um, and 
for a chronic condition, it's a substantial risk. Um, pediatric long COVID, as we know, involves cognitive dysfunction that severely limits students' um, capacity to learn and participate in academic life, leading to a decline in performance and increased absenteeism. This threatens long-term educational outcomes and opportunities. Um, we saw with the clock study and subsequent research uh, that they've documented how pervasive fatigue and neurological symptoms of long COVID disrupt schooling and social activities. Um, <clears throat> and 70% of those uh, who are afflicted suffer from ongoing physical symptoms. Um, there's also an evident negative impact on mental health, mood, and cognitive abilities, which exacerbates the challenges in academic settings. Um, one study actually shows uh, among undergraduates, uh, sorry, uh, among undergraduates that um, there's a marked decrease in the ability to have outstanding academic performance at university. Um, and so when we look at the health disparities, we use the framework of the WHO's social determinants of health. Um, we see that health inequities stem from socioeconomic factors and healthcare access, which also determine pre existing conditions. And we see how long COVID exploits and intensifies health disparities. Up to 87% of hospitalized um, COVID survivors and 50% of the non hospitalized survivors, particularly from marginalized communities, experience lasting symptoms like fatigue and breathing problems. Um, housing insecurity among those with lower socioeconomic status and functional limitations is a major socioeconomic risk factor for long COVID as well. So we've seen now multiple studies showing us the disparities of race, class, gender, and education status um, as risk factors for long COVID and its severity. Um, and we really require stronger COVID-aware social safety nets and healthcare access. So to conclude, um, in the context of a public health emergency, failing to intervene not only worsens existing inequalities, but also creates new ones. There's a feedback loop between policy and public opinion and behavior toward mitigations like mask wearing and infrastructure upgrades, which together determine health outcomes. So we need scientifically informed public health policies. Instead, we're getting um, outsized political influence from special interest groups that are part of the privatization movement. Um, with a history of science denialism regarding climate change and harms of tobacco, um, the libertarian think tank American Institute for Economic Research sponsored the Great Barrington Declaration, which then pushed for return to work and school with inadequate mitigations by promoting the false notion of herd immunity through mass infection of children and youth, um, whose risks have been repeatedly minimized. Um, but half of the youth in a recent study uh, stated that they are concerned about developing long COVID, showing that such policies neglect children and youth. And so the gaps in reliable information that are created by non-interventionism are filled with anti-scientific misinformation and ill-informed policies, which undermine scientific consensus, especially regarding vaccines and other mitigations, including among medical professionals, um, and this creates undue skepticism and health risks. So imposing an unregulated pandemic on the American public, the majority of whom demanded a well-coordinated pandemic response from government to protect public health is the result of political extremism that's underwritten by libertarian ideology, promoting government non-intervention to facilitate short-sighted economic activities over public health, marking a shift away from public welfare and pandemic management. Although deregulation is a long-standing feature of neoliberal economic governance, the coordinated abandonment of mitigation measures for infection control of a novel pathogen causing substantial rates of mortality and morbidity 
while it is in high endless circulation is unprecedented. And outsourcing the pandemic management to individual decision-making advances the broader libertarian aim of privatizing public health and education by first eroding the institutions upholding them in order to fill the void with market-based solutions, quote unquote. Um, when public institutions adopt handoff, like hands-off policies, they set themselves up for failure for their duties to intervene in public emergencies, rendering self-inflicted wounds that accelerate the process of undermining themselves. And creating such a vacuum in power and authority paves the way for private interests and even creates opportunities for reactionary policies because non-interventionism increases socioeconomic inequalities, which risks societal disorder, and this creates political appetite for more authoritarian type regimes to exercise social control. And revising the terms and conditions of the social contract without the informed consent of the public is part of this precarious social experiment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pantea. Um, lots of really important political critique there. So um, while people are um, thinking about some questions, our next speaker is Matt Mazewski. Mazewski, or I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Matt, but let me know. Uh, Mazewski, it's Mazewski, but close Mazewski. enough. Mazewski. Um, thank you. Um, so, Matt, if you could get your presentation up, that'd be great. And let's see what um, questions there are for Pantea. Um, Sarah says, loved your presentation and acknowledgement of the broad Barrington effect. As an LC patient, I'd encourage you to add prior disability to your list of determinants, race, gender, etc. Also, as patients with lived experience, we see a lot of talk about anxiety and depression in the LC. I'd love to see the psych profession um, seek to understand grief and the impact of systemic ableism. Kids to social determinants of health, as you have, and loss of identity on mental health. I personally feel like this is an angle that's not often considered. What are your thoughts? Um, sorry, I didn't hear the entirety of the comment, but um, but I certainly am really interested. I, I discuss in the paper itself the history of kind of uh, the morphing of these historical problems with um, accusing women of hysteria, and we see that being applied to new uh, chronic illnesses, especially long COVID, because of the fact of these political processes that I discuss in the paper. And so, um, so yeah, I'm really concerned about that in particular. Of course, I also acknowledge that um, while we do see a high prevalence, disproportionate prevalence among uh, females for long COVID diagnosis, um, that there are a lot of studies also showing um, male sufferers. And, and as with other kinds of chronic diseases, I think there has to be a lot of, um, outreach to male populations and awareness raising um, across the board so that uh, because of the stigma of, of sort of admitting these kinds of um, symptoms. Yes, that's an interesting sort of gender, gender discrimination, isn't it? <laughs> the fact that men's suffering often isn't acknowledged just because of sort of, I guess, gendered, you know, toxic masculinity in some ways that men shouldn't reveal that they are suffering from chronic illness, including long COVID. Um, not to say that women with long COVID aren't, you know, gendered in, in negative ways as well, but it affects, there's, there's different impacts on people from of different genders. Yes, um, I certainly argue that if, if men are uncomfortable talking about it, it will have effect on all genders. Yes. Just looking, lots of comments about comprehensiveness of your of, of your discussion. Um, do we know any? Sue says, do we know any countries who do not have the same issue with non-interventionism? How do we get our governments to act? I'd, I'd be interested to know if anyone knows of countries at the moment or governments 
that are doing a better job because I don't know of any, but does anyone know of any governments where they haven't let things completely slide? Specific to long COVID or just pandemic response in general? I think probably in relation to first COVID control, because of course, as we know, if we control COVID, we control long COVID. Um, I do know I a really interesting fact about Cuba. Someone just mentioned Cuba. I saw um, that they had sort of the reverse response in terms of vaccination development. They really focused a lot on children. They knew and they assumed because of epi epidemiological data going back decades that schools are hubs of transmission. So they didn't flip it around the way that we did in North America um, about uh, that, you know, schools are safe. <laughs> they knew that schools were definitely virus stews. And so they focused on developing a child vaccine first and, and vaccinating school children first. So that was a very interesting um, difference of approach. And of course, there's a lot of um, kind of blocking of information <laughs> about what goes on in Cuba and the US. And so it's kind of hard to find um, information about these kinds of responses. But I know overall, they've had very low mortality com compared to the US. Yeah, that's a really, really good example. Um, and of course, in many countries, including Australia, if uh, infants and young children under the age of five aren't even don't have access to any vaccines still, sadly. Um, Danny mentioned the experience of people of diverse genders remains unknown. Yes, that's a really good point, Danny. Um, yeah, and as Lewis also mentions that, the interesting note about the effect of long COVID on transgender population. So obviously more research needed there in terms of diverse genders. Um, and yeah, in relation to um, on HRT and the interactions there if people are taking HRT, um, how that might be affecting their health and responses. I've actually done a, a study, um, not on long COVID, but on diverse communities and their understandings of immunity in relation to COVID and other infectious diseases and that did actually include, include non-binary and transgendered people we're just running up the research there and they do mention things like hormone supplements actually and how they affect their immunity but I haven't got around to yet yeah, we're just still working on analyzing and present and writing up those data um one one last question let's see Uh, Lewis does mention that I know AFAB people more likely to develop conditions like POTS than a AMAB people. Yeah, lots lots of really interesting and important issues to, to discuss there, absolutely. So I think they are the main questions and comments. People have suggested some other places like Singapore and Belgium that have traditionally um, been excellent with their COVID control. And I think they've sort of, a lot of those countries like Australia and New Zealand have also sort of gone back and forth a bit in terms of having long periods of excellent management and then dropping the ball at some point as well. All right, well, thanks very much, Penteo. We'll now move on to Matt, who's at um, Rutgers University. Um, please begin your presentation, Matt. Okay, well, thank you so much. Can you Can you see my screen okay? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Thank oh, you. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Matt Mazuski. It's really great to be here today. And I really appreciate uh, Professor Lupton uh, giving me the opportunity to speak and also for convening uh, this really important uh, symposium on, on a very vital topic. Uh, so this is a project that's called The Economic Burden of Long COVID in the United States, Evidence from the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. And this is still uh, very much a work in progress. Uh, but as an economist uh, who is very concerned about the, the ongoing COVID crisis, I've been closely following this emerging uh, economic literature on the economic burden of long COVID. 
And there have been a handful of papers that have been trickling out over the past few years looking at this question. And uh, the estimates are, you know, vary. And um, each paper is sort of looking at different, different specific um, aspects of this economic burden. But the consensus seems to be that the this burden is already considerable. Uh, so I saw that someone in the chat had mentioned the Harvard economist David Cutler, who has put together one of the most comprehensive uh, attempts to estimate the holistic economic burden of, of long COVID in the U.S. And so this is uh, figures that he put out in 2022, where he tried to break down the economic cost of long COVID into a few different components, namely direct medical costs associated with um, expenditures on care, reduced earnings or lost productivity, foregone wages, and then in addition to that, uh, reduced quality of life. So essentially attempting to measure the morbidity burden of long COVID in, in dollar terms. And so, you know, it's important to note that uh, even though we are starting to see some of these analyses, the techniques that have been employed to study this question to date do have some important limitations. So for one, researchers who have been looking at this issue of lost wages or lost productivity due to long COVID um, have, have run into some data limitations and have been unable to explore certain aspects of heterogeneity, um, for example, heterogeneity across affected individuals by the severity of their illness. Uh, another important limitation is that some of these attempts to quantify quality of life impacts in monetary terms, um, for instance, the analysis by Professor Cutler, have relied primarily on concepts such as quality adjusted life years or disability adjusted life years, which are colloquially referred to as qualies or dollies. Um, and these are uh, constructs that have been criticized on both methodological as well as philosophical or ethical grounds. So these are basically weights that are assigned to individuals that say, if someone has a particular health condition, you know, what is the value of a year of their life relative to a year of life in perfect health? And so there are not only um, ethical concerns around that idea, but also methodological issues related to where those weights come from, and in particular, the fact that they're often drawn from surveys of healthy individuals who are asked to uh, make projections about how, how they would experience a particular health condition that they actually don't have direct experience with. So the objective of this project, which, as I said, is still very much in progress, is to try to offer a, a new uh, set of comprehensive estimates of these various aspects of the economic burden of long COVID by drawing on data from a special special module that was recently added to a large biennial panel survey in the United States that's called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, or PSID. Um, and so in 20, starting in 2021, the PSID added questions about um, various aspects of uh, COVID vaccination, COVID infection history, and so on. And so this offers a unique data source that can let us get at um, some of these questions related to economic costs. And importantly, can allow us to do so in a way that limits the need to rely on ad hoc assumptions about, for instance, the relative value that individuals place on a year of good health or the earnings loss that's associated with long COVID of a given level of severity. So some of these existing studies have basically tried to draw data from a bunch of different sources, prevalence figures from one source, uh, figures on earnings loss from a small survey of a different set of individuals and try to combine them to get at the desired estimates. Um, and what's attractive about the PSID is that we can try to estimate some of these same figures using data from one source. So just to give a little bit more context on the PSID, so this is, as I said, a survey that's run every two years that's administered by the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. Uh, it was first uh, run in 1968 and is actually believed to be the longest running household panel survey in the world. So at this point, it's a nationally representative sample of households that includes over 9,000 households and uh, more than 24,000 unique individuals. Uh, respondents are queried about a very wide range of uh, topics, including income, other aspects of assets, personal finances, pensions, as well as work history and health status and disability. Um, and now as of 
the most recent two waves of the survey also includes, as I said, a set of questions about COVID-19, vaccination, infection history, and importantly, questions about persistent or chronic symptoms associated with COVID infection, um, as well as the self-reported severity of those symptoms, which is a really unique feature that uh, other surveys about COVID and long COVID don't necessarily um, drill down to. So just to show some stylized facts here on what we see in these data uh, to try to uh, reassure you that you know, these findings are consistent with what we know from other sources. This is a graph showing you uh, for the 2021 wave, the percentage of the US population that reported having had COVID by that point. And so this is um, drawing both on uh, reports from individuals who um, uh, related that they had been tested, others who reported symptoms, but who were not necessarily tested. So this is um, self-reports, not, not just PCR tests. And um, basically we see here that the self-reported prevalence of COVID by the 2021 wave was just under a third of the, pop the adult population. And by the uh, 2023 wave had risen to just over half of the population. So these estimates are, are broadly consistent with what we know from other sources about the uh, really significant jump in prevalence of COVID infection with the arrival of Omicron. Uh, getting to long COVID, so this is from the 2021 wave, the prevalence of self-reported long COVID. So uh, percentages of all individuals who reported having had COVID by that point in time, uh, what fraction of them reported experiencing persistent symptoms. And in 2021, it was only about 7% of individuals that said that they were dealing with long COVID. By 2023, uh, the results are a little bit hard to compare because there was a new option that was added that was basically... Um, may have long COVID or have persistent symptoms that may be due to COVID, but the person is not exactly sure what brought them on. And so this is actually um, important and um, an advantage in some sense of these data because um, self-reports are often limited by the fact that individuals may be dealing with long COVID who may not actually know that they had an acute COVID infection. So here we see that although the percentage reporting that they actually have long COVID is roughly comparable to 2021, we see this other significant chunk of about 11% of the population that says they may have long COVID, um, which is really, really noteworthy. Um, what's also really important is that, as I said, these data show, uh, allow you to see the distribution of severity. So this is uh, results for, these are results for 2021 where individuals were asked to rate their long COVID symptoms as mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. And so we can kind of see this uh, pattern here where, you know, just under half are rating their symptoms as mild or moderate, um, just under half each in each of those categories. Um, but this other significant portion of just over 10% consider themselves to be severe or very severe. And so I think what's really helpful about these data is that it can kind of allow us to reconcile some of these estimates that come from different sources. Um, you know, People will often say, how could it possibly be that 20% of the population has long COVID? You know, one in five people are not completely unable to work or com completely housebound and, and so on. And I think what this is really um, illustrating very, very clearly is that there is this distribution of severity. There is a very sizable uh, fraction of the population that is um, affected to some extent. Um, and, and while there is a, a subset that is very severely affected, that, that does account for a smaller portion of the total. And so here's the distribution for 2023. We see maybe some movement uh, shift of that distribution towards the mild category, but still very noteworthy that there's a significant portion in the severe and very severe buckets. Um, so in addition to collecting information about income finances and now um, COVID and long COVID, the PSID also queries respondents about their general life satisfaction. And this is um, rated on a five point scale. So what's what's really attractive about this is that it offers a very unique opportunity to estimate what, what's called the compensating income variation of COVID-associated chronic conditions. So informally, the compensating income variation is a concept from economics, or more specifically from health economics, that refers to the income loss that would be associated with a drop in well-being equivalent to that associated with a particular chronic health condition. So I think there are limitations to this approach as well, and we should be cautious about putting interpretations on this, like, you know, if you give a 
sick person a certain amount of money, they'll be just as happy as if they weren't sick. Um, but this is really an attempt, uh, a way that economists try to, you know, quantify quality of life impacts and and determine, um, you know, how much how much of an impact a condition has on a person's general life satisfaction, and to try to put that in in monetary terms, even though we know there may be philosophical problems with doing that. Um, and as I said earlier, this is potentially superior to approaches that rely on qualities or dollies because we're not necessarily uh, counting on individuals to give hypothetical, um, it, these are not weights that are drawn from asking individuals to entertain hypotheticals about conditions with which they have no direct experience. So this analysis is still underway, but what I wanted to show you here is that um, we've taken an initial look at the impact of different chronic health conditions that the PSID asks about, um, the impact that those have on this life satisfaction measure. And what we see is that as expected, uh, individuals with the most severe cases of long COVID seem, do seem to experience the largest reductions in well-being. Um, and the impact of severe or very severe long COVID is really among the worst of all the conditions on which the PSID is collecting data. So what this picture is showing you here is uh, an estimated impact of each of these conditions on this uh, standard well-being measure that, that's included in the PSID. So this is on a five-point scale. So negative estimates here represent reductions in well-being and there's a line at zero, which would mean no impact on well-being. And so what we can see is that up at the top of the, of the chart, you can see that the most negative estimates are associated with seizure disorder and severe, very severe long COVID, um, with moderate long COVID being farther down the list, um, having a lesser but still negative impact on quality of life, and then mild long COVID um, being near the, near the bottom. I think we should also be cautious about the fact that um, it looks like some of these estimates here might be positive. I don't think that should be taken to mean that, um, you know, having a condition like allergies or mild long COVID makes you better off, um, makes you more satisfied with life. But this is really just saying that um, given the data that we have and given the how, how um, coarse this measure is in some ways, um, it's really not possible to precisely estimate um, some of these some of these effects when they have a lesser magnitude. And so, uh, you know, the next step of this project is really going to be continuing to extend this analysis to try to um, think about um, associating, uh, qu quantifying some of these impacts in monetary terms uh, and seeing how, how that compares to some of these analyses that have been done previously using concepts like polys or dollies. Um, so as I said, much work remains, um, but I appreciate everyone listening today and your comments and questions are, are more than welcome. My email is there if anyone um, wants to reach out and, and get in touch. So thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. Really interesting. Um, we, we do have a, a question already from Jordan and he's asked, did the severity distribution in 2023 include only those with long COVID or also those that may have, may have long COVID? Yeah, so that's a good, uh, that's a good question. I believe it includes both. Uh, so, so I think even people that said they weren't sure if they had long COVID were also asked about the severity of the symptoms that may or may not have been long COVID. Um, so we could break that down further, but it's possible that part of the reason why this is maybe more shifted towards the mild end of the distribution is because we're including more people that, um, you know, have a condition that is really attributable to something else. Okay, thanks. And Lou asks, I think that in that last graph, if you want to go to the very last graph that you showed, Matt, yeah. um, fibro and it, fibro and ME um, should be yeah. either separated out or divided into severe, moderate, um, or mild like long COVID was. Yeah, so I, I absolutely agree. These categories are the categories, unfortunately, that are in the PSID. So we're kind of um, I actually, as I was reading through this, I had a similar thought and some of the other things that are bundled together really seem like they should be separated out or are listed the wrong category. For instance, um, uh, there's a category that says autoimmune disorder, but then the category that says inflammatory disorder, they give as an example of that multiple sclerosis, which I'm not sure why that's not, you know, included as an autoimmune disorder, but um, but I think I think this is a scheme that was developed many years ago and probably, you know, in the interest of having consistent results over time has not really been refined. But 
Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with the point about fibromyalgia and um, it doesn't even say ME, but ME-CFS, um, that these are probably bundling together, you know, a wide spectrum of cases. I mean, you could probably say that about most of those conditions, right? I mean, absolutely, yeah. Severe mild sure. the allergies, severe mild um, anemia. <laughs> Quite a few yeah. of those would be interesting. But yeah. Yeah, I take your point that these were all oh, categories that have been around for a long time, so you can't really fiddle too much with them now. Um, Emma has also um, mentioned slide 14, the same slide, and she says it's so interesting, it would be great to explore interactions between those rows. Amazing work. Mm. Yeah. Um, seeing what else? Bex, men, Bex made the comment, it's going to be a huge challenge now that so few are even testing. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a major problem with any kind of data, a big data analysis. Um, in that many countries, including Australia, but the US and many other countries around the world, people just aren't even testing. So we just the data on case long on COVID cases to begin with, let alone how people can therefore make the connection between their symptoms and having COVID if they haven't tested themselves is is a massive problem, isn't it, for these kinds of data analyses. Yeah. And something also to mention on, on that point is uh, between 2021 and 2023, some of the questions were changed uh, as far as ascertaining who had COVID. So in 2021, there was a very detailed set of questions about, have you been tested? Um, if you haven't been tested, have you met with a medical professional who told you you may have had COVID? Uh, have you been exposed to a family member who had COVID, which led you to believe you also may have had COVID and so on? And in 2023, those were all collapsed into one question that just says, have you had COVID or do you believe you've had COVID? And so it's also, as you say, maybe not so clear if we're measuring exactly the same thing in those two waves, because maybe everyone's perception of uh, you know, what, what they're basing their belief about whether they've had COVID on has, has shifted over time. Yes. Yeah, a lot of really interesting questions there. We'll have to leave it there for now, but the, you may, I guess you can answer some questions too in the chat as other presenters have been doing as well. So thanks very much again, Matt. Oh, sorry, I, haven't, I didn't Thank ask um, Matt Ventresca and um, the next presenters, Matt Ventresca and Mary McDonald. But um, to, to put their slides up. Ah, there you go. So you're all ready to go. Sorry, Deborah, I jumped in ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, so you go, you go, oh, hang on a minute. Good over. Oh, oh, Pippa and Kirsty's turn yet. Oh, no worries. You're ready to go, though. That's good to know. So um, Matt and Mary, if you could um, begin your presentation now. Thanks very much. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deborah. I'm uh, I'm Matt Ventresca, my, uh, my co-author uh, for this presentation is uh, Dr. Mary McDonald. Uh, we're both members of the Sports Society and Technology Research Collective at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Uh, we're so grateful to be part of this wonderful symposium. Uh, I'm learning so much from all of you, and, and thanks to Deborah for, for getting us all together. Our presentation today is about uh, representations of long COVID in the North American sports media. A professional college and amateur sporting organizers around the world memorably responded to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic by canceling or postponing events. The absence of these sporting events quickly came to symbolize how the pandemic was disrupting social life. As societies gradually reopened, athletes' bodies became prominent sites of technological and scientific intervention, as many players masked, were routinely tested for the virus, quarantined if infected, and most accepted vaccinations to continue playing. Given the highly visible status of sport, particularly elite mediated sport, these early proactive responses helped communicate the importance of public health measures in mitigating the impact of COVID-19. However, much as with other aspects of social life globally, sports organizations shed these protective strategies over time, further exposing athletes, the cultural embodiments of health and vigor, to acute and chronic illness. 
we trace these trajectories within our larger project, uh, which involves the creation of a collection of online multimedia resources, analyzing the social cultural connections between sports and the COVID-19 pandemic. The official launch of the COVID sports project is coming very, very soon. In this presentation, we draw upon cultural studies perspectives to explicate media representations of three athletes who have experienced long COVID. Women's National Basketball Association player A.B. Durr and National Hockey League players Jonathan Taves and Brandon Sutter. As a member of the New York Liberty, Durr experienced long COVID symptoms early in the pandemic prior to the advent of vaccinations. Taves, a multi-time All-Star and longtime captain of the Chicago Blackhawks, announced in February 2023 that he was experiencing long COVID symptoms and was stepping away from hockey to focus on his health. This announcement came after Taves had sat out the entire 2020-21 season due to health problems he attributed to a condition called chronic immune or inflammatory response syndrome. Sutter was one of 21 Vancouver Canuck players who contracted COVID during a 2021 team outbreak. He missed the 2021-22 and 2022-23 seasons due to long COVID before retiring after a brief comeback try in the fall of 2023. Our analysis of these three cases is based on examination of over 200 news accounts that describe these players' illnesses. At first glance, these representations seemingly counter dominant narratives suggesting that young, able-bodied individuals are immune from the debilitating consequences of COVID-19. Yet these narratives often stop short of confronting the social conditions in which long COVID occurs, and only nominally situate athlete experiences within broader understandings of public health. Instead, much like other illness storylines, these media reports tended to draw upon individualized militaristic metaphors, constructing players as committed to battling and overcoming a debilitating condition. Moreover, a common theme across these cases is how these and other narratives have failed to sustain much momentum or generate a sense of urgency to safeguard athlete health. We therefore suggest that sports media discourses are important, although underappreciated sites of public pedagogy, communicating competing meanings around healthy and unhealthy bodies in pandemic times. Used here, public pedagogy refers to the ways in which popular cultural forms and figures serve as important communicative sites through which people learn and cultivate ways to think about key issues of social, political, and economic import, in this case, around COVID-19. The illness narratives of Durr and Sutter are similar, as both players are quoted as revealing the harsh symptoms they, uh, they experienced and how these effects impacted their quality of life. In contrast, stories about Taves include much less detail about his illness, although these reports still provide more general descriptions of how long COVID impacts bodies. So these accounts all highlight common markers of the disease that we've heard about through many of the presentations. Uh, fatigue, vomiting, nausea, lung pain, shortness of breath, persistent cough, cognitive impairment, gastrointestinal distress, confusion, headaches, and coughing up blood, to mention but a few manifestations. Interestingly for Taves, his illness is articulated through a concurrent diagnosis of chronic immune response syndrome or CIRS, a condition whereby exposure to biotoxins such as mold generates an overactive inflammatory response to bodily stressors. Some early reports included comments from medical experts speculating that his previous COVID infection might have been the trigger for his CIRS symptoms. But Tave's subsequent retirement announcement came with no elaboration about how the dual diagnoses of CIRS and long COVID coexist. Across all three cases, Descriptions of such debilitating symptoms were often accompanied by epidemiological statistics estimating the prevalence of long COVID within the general population, 
to suggest that these athlete stories were not isolated cases. So discussions of prevalence and narrations of the athlete's symptoms thus counter common sense perspectives that COVID simply impacts those who are old, have pre-existing medical conditions, or are immunocompromised. In, these way, uh, in this way, these representations, however fleeting or subtle, have the potential to communicate a new normal that anybody, even athletes who presumably epitomize health and fitness, might be subject to chronic impairment due to long COVID. In some examples, this reality is portrayed through the athlete's inability to return to fitness routines or any level of athletic performance. So Durr reveals seven months after their initial COVID infection that their symptoms were so severe that they, quote, still couldn't even shoot a free throw. Uh, Sutter, recounts in 2022 that despite feeling 100% better than a year previous, he couldn't train or work out. Sutter said, quote, when I take it easier, I'm okay, but when I work out, it just crushes me. In other instances, these athletes explain how their difficult and often unpredictable symptoms have impacted their lives beyond sport. So Durr said in 2021, and I quote, there are days I feel great, I can go out, I can go to the store and clean the house, and there are others that I just want to stay in bed. I feel like I've been hit by a bus. Amidst vivid language documenting the physical and mental toll of long COVID, many representations frequently capture the athletes through a familiar trope of an individual battling illness, a discourse that has been well documented in discussions of cancer and HIV AIDS, for example. So one headline uh, proclaimed that after a two-year battle with COVID, uh, that Sutter was launching a comeback with the Edmonton Oilers in 2023. But importantly, this militarized narrative of battle articulates with another common framing within sport, which is that athletes are often fighting on and off the field to overcome barriers to success, including those of poverty, injury, personal family tragedies, and other challenging life circumstances. So after Durr missed the 2020 WNBA season, the basketball player expressed the will to return to play in 2021, saying, I'm not a quitter. I definitely fight. No matter where I am right now, I know every day is important to my recovery process. So I just keep going. So metaphors of fighting and battles in these storylines are in some ways aligned with the language used in early stages of the pandemic that identified an enemy in the virus, a strategy to flatten the curve, but also to save the economy, the frontline warriors and healthcare personnel, people on the home front isolating at home, and the traitors and deserters who were breaking social distancing rules. And while this more metaphor arc was used somewhat productively for a time, to mobilize public health resources and a sense of collective responsibility, the Durr, Taves, and Sutter storylines are simply not as expansive. Rather, these three athletic narratives communicate battles that individuals are engaged in to return to play. And we argue that the conventional trope of the athlete comeback story constrains any recognition of the social or medical specificities of COVID-19 even when these comeback attempts prove to be unsuccessful. As such, the militarized framing in these three cases articulate a familiar sensibility that individuals are responsible for managing and ultimately working to recover their own health. In this way, these sporting tales help to constitute the status quo as a notion of individual responsibility to maintain one's health quickly became the unofficial and then now the official North American pandemic policy position. But what we find noteworthy here is how these and similar athlete stories have not contributed to the creation of broader discourses establishing long COVID as an urgent public health concern when that has occurred around other sports issues. Take for example, how athlete narratives of brain injury and neurodegenerative disease coalesce to inform the framing of concussion as a public health crisis in many, in many places. 
So thus, the representations of athletes with long COVID perform complicated cultural work. Despite providing momentary disruptions of sport and society's normalization of COVID illness, the individualistic militarized frameworks within these three storylines reproduce characterizations of long COVID as a personal trouble rather than a matter, matter of social or public health concern. Thanks very much and uh, happy to take some questions. Thanks, Matt. So, yeah, it's really, it's people have been reflecting on similar sort of situations in our own countries. Um, and I think we can all think of examples across lots of different elite sports where you get to hear of people withdrawing from matches or competition or whatever, or training <laughs> um, due to long COVID. But as you say, it, it's often very personalised and for some reason doesn't seem to have much of an impact on people who, their fans and, you know, making them aware. Um, I mean, Jordan, for example, has talked about our Australian cricket players um, who we, we're told they actually continue to play on the field even though they have COVID. I mean, that's quite amazing, let alone long COVID, but actually infected with COVID, they're now allowed to play. Um seeing if there's any questions and I'm also thinking about the parallels of course with elite um, you know pop stars rock stars who constantly tour around and, and do some of them do seem to engage in self-protective behaviors to protect their voices and performing you know profits but um, don't seem to care too much about the tens of thousands of people in the audience who may be sharing COVID with each other um, Mark says, Mark Davis says, thanks, Matt and Mary. Any narrative on the immune self? Um, so uh, I think what he's trying to say, what he's asking there is um, in your findings, is there anything about how immunity is understood in relation to COVID and long COVID and elite sports people? Uh, and the, the short answer, the short answer is, is no. Um, in any of the narratives that we looked at, um, either within this project that's specific around on long COVID um, or within the broader project, although I'm correcting myself now, I mean, so within the long COVID project, there wasn't really a lot of discussion about immunity, uh, either in terms of athletes uh, building immunity or um, or having compromised immunity sort of post post COVID within these storylines, um, that wasn't necessarily uh, a thing that that came up. It's, I think in the, in the broader COVID narratives around sport, um, we do see uh, a lot of discussions about um, athletes wanting to uh, build, build immunity to protect themselves. And, and then a lot of that sort of ventures into um, a lot of alternative health discourses and, 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 and pseudoscientific um, discussions of, oh, this is, I'm building an immunity this way, and therefore I can refuse a vaccination um, and things like that. But uh, yeah, in terms of um, immunity as a construct within the discourses we looked at, um, it was it was mostly an afterthought um, in, in those discussions. Oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, sorry, Kirsty, you can now, you can now get ready to share your presentation. We'll maybe take one more question or comment for Matt while you're getting yours up. Um, people have talked about, um, oh, yes, so just as your last question, Matt, um, Koa, sorry if I've mispronounced your name, Koa, but Koa Webster, thanks, Matt, for an interesting analysis. Do you have any insight into why these LC athlete stories are being framed in this individualistic battle type of narrative? Well, I can already, I can already think of a reason that that's sort of the dominant narrative of elite sport as well isn't it? but what, what do you have to say Matt yeah I think I think <laughs> that's uh it's such a familiar narrative um and what's interesting is that you know this this these battle metaphors they they come from the journalists but they're also coming from the athletes themselves um so it's certainly a familiar discourse that is uh that is available to them um it's it's how they understand their their lives in a lot of ways and it's certainly a compelling narrative that media audiences um really uh really latch on to it really resonates with the media audiences again the sort of athlete combat story so here i think there's this 
really interesting convergence of that framework within elite sport and within sport media, um, but then also within um, just illness narratives more broadly. So you have those two things coming together. And in, in many ways, I think, yeah, these these athlete narratives are are very much a, a kind of logical home for these sort of battle narratives. But I think the next stage of the project, uh, I believe, will be, and it's what we're trying to do with our with the COVID sport project is is how do we how do we start to challenge that uh, in a meaningful way and and shine light on different ways to understand athlete experiences um, so that they're performing different work, uh, different cultural work than sort of reproducing these very familiar tropes around about battles and redemption and overcoming adversity. Yeah, that'd be really interesting, Matt, to, to check that out when you progress further with your research. Thanks very much. So our final um, talk for session one today is is um, we will not be silent. Well, that's a, that's a really great sort of message to send out to the community, isn't it? Um, and um, it's really great to see that the Australian Long COVID community are co-participants, co-presenters and researchers here in this um, particular presentation. So um, it'll be Kirsty Yates who will be presenting. Um, so go ahead, please, Kirsty. Thanks so much, Deborah, and thanks so much for holding this session. Um, I'm speaking to everyone today from unceded Ngunnawal and Ngambri land. Um, and, and the title for our presentation was, was chosen quite specifically. Um, you know, even today, our lead presenter was literally unable to speak well enough um, to present today. Another one of us um, is heading into a crash. Um, you know, I just had to yet again delay a, a specialist appointment simply because there's no telehealth available. Um, and for myself, uh, you know, this is my one big thing I'll do today. And, and after this, I'll retreat to a dark room to, to recover. Um, so this is living um, with long COVID. Um, our presentation draws on the lived experience of more than 4,000 Australians living with long COVID. Every day we wake to the reality of living with an infection associated illness. Many of us had mild breakthrough infections. And whilst we are often made to feel invisible, we are not the first and nor will we be the last to suffer this fate. But what makes us unusual is that the size of our cohort and our ability to connect and learn through shared experience across continents. The Australian long COVID community was formed by three women back in June 2020, so the first year of the pandemic, with the aim of providing online peer support for Australians living with ongoing symptoms or vaccine injury. In February 2022, our membership was 250, and by November 2022, it had grown to more than 3,000. Today, our membership is just over 4,700, and we're welcoming, on average, around 30 new members every week. The details that follow come from two surveys of our membership. The first in November 2022 was for the parliamentary inquiry into long COVID and repeated infections. The second in September 2023 was to inform the Commonwealth Pandemic Response Inquiry. Each survey was completed by more than 600 members. And as we struggle to fit our post-infection bodies into our pre-infection lives, most of us would not have thought to say we had suffered an epistemic injustice but every single one of us could describe the feeling of not being heard, of taking the time to provide a careful account of our symptoms and having our testimony dismissed or denied. Testimonial injustice is a very personal thing. It is to question the capacity of the knower to know. In October of 2022, we certainly knew more about the nature of long COVID than many of the doctors that we consulted but we had difficulty finding words to explain the magnitude of our incapacity to those who resolutely declared our good health based on normal test results. And we wondered about the wisdom of using these so-called standard tests to measure the impacts of a novel virus that was really wreaking havoc in our bodies and our lives. By October 2022, 60% of us had experienced disbelief when seeking medical care. 75% of us had had our symptoms minimised. 58% of us had been offered outdated treatments such as graded exercise therapy that is based on the now discredited PACE study, 
which aim to treat MECFS ultimately in harmful ways. And this really reinforces those links and experience across both ME and long COVID that were explored in more detail in, in Cathy Anderson's earlier presentation. 62% uh, of us had, had experienced negative health outcomes as a result of poor communication. And 62% of us had sought care from a doctor who was unwilling to provide a diagnosis. In the absence of shared conceptual resources such as diagnostic criteria and treatment protocols, doctors seemed incapable of acknowledging our incapacity, let alone applying their knowledge and training to repurpose existing treatments to lessen our suffering. From our online discussions, we knew that there were clusters of familiar symptoms, but our failure to present with something that was known to medical science meant that our problems were our own. We were considered anxious or depressed, that we developed maladjusted responses to an illness that had passed, we were well and truly on our own. By October 2022, 32% of us were absent from work with benefits and a further 28% absent without benefits. 8% of us had been let go. 3% of us had taken on less demanding roles in the same company and another 2% had moved to less demanding roles in a different company. And 26% of us were working reduced hours. Of those amongst us studying, 45% were absent, 15% had discontinued, 21% were, were remote, and 30% had suspended. Absent from work and unable to access benefits due to a lack of formal diagnostic criteria, many experienced significant financial hardship. Few of us would call this hermeneutical injustice, but this is what it is. It is structural inequality based on testimonial injustice and a failure to develop shared conceptual resources or put our shared conceptual and economic resources to work in the face of the unknown to ensure that no harm is done. In October 2022, many of us were housebound or bedbound, and we knew we were struggling with simple things like showering, washing our hair, changing the bed linen, loading the washing machine, hanging out the washing, cooking a simple meal, or even sitting with our feet on the floor long enough to eat a meal with our families. But we didn't ask those questions in our first survey. Um, in our attempts to be taken seriously, we modelled our survey on other surveys and asked about things that our culture most values. 70% of us experienced daily challenges with exercise. 62% of us experienced daily challenges with recreational activities and 60% of us experienced daily challenges with socialising. So in the absence of agreed upon diagnostic criteria and treatment protocols, not only were we denied access to care that might actually improve our symptoms, but we were also being slowly pushed to the margins of our personal lives or becoming dependent on loved ones and relatives, themselves ill-equipped and unsupported in reorienting their own lives to take on more caring responsibilities. In our 2023 survey, focusing on the Commonwealth Government's pandemic response, members' support for government policy was highest at 72% in 2020, dropping to 39% in 2022 after the lifting of all mitigation strategies, and down to 14% in 2023 as we began to understand the negative impact of public health by personal responsibility on our lives. When considering key COVID-19 policies, between 30 to just over 40% of members rated those relating to vaccination, PPE, testing and quarantine in the good to excellent. Whilst those governing access to antivirals and data collection were rated far more poorly. In terms of the response to long COVID, members were unanimous in calling out both the inadequacy of support and the absence of public health messaging regarding the existence, nature, and risks of long COVID. None of the survey two questions were framed in terms of epistemic injustice, not even in lay language. So it is particularly striking how many respondents use their energy to highlight acts or omissions that resulted in the silencing of patient testimony or in the perpetuation of structural epistemic injustices. The most significant of which was the failure of public health messaging a failure to provide information putting everyone at risk, increasing barriers to care and isolating the vulnerable. It is also interesting to note that 64% of all free text responses to the question, 
to the catch-all question, anything else you'd like to tell us, fell within the remit of epistemic injustice. Members mentioned a wide range of issues providing direct evidence of testimonial injustice or detailing the consequences of structural or hermeneutical injustice. This includes significant structural challenges in the form of poor or absent policy leading to inadequate care, the sense of not being heard or understood, a pervasive sense of abandonment, poor public messaging that compounds the challenges we face in being believed by our families, colleagues and doctors. Despite this, we refuse to be silent. Living at the edge of what is known, we understand the devastating impact of poor public health messaging on our ability to get a diagnosis or access treatment to manage the multitude of debil debilitating symptoms that we live with every day. We live with a cascade of poor health outcomes where those of us carrying the highest burden are often too sick to access healthcare and are routinely denied access to financial and disability support. And all of us must live in a world where each additional infection might be the one to push us to the point of no return. We may be the ones experiencing the consequences of UDU healthcare in which no records are kept so no problems exist and normal test results indicate medical anxiety and no treatment protocols mean no symptom management. But according to the WHO, 10% of all infections will result in some form of long COVID. So the risks of ending up where we are are mounting for everyone everywhere. And with that, I'd like to thank those people living with long COVID who took the time, often at considerable personal costs, to document and collate their stories, enable us to share the theme and flavour of those with you today. Uh, as people living with long COVID, we'd also like to thank all the people here today and involved in this for the ways in which your work lifts the lid on this invisible illness. And we'd also really welcome your support on the upcoming International Long COVID Awareness Day on the 15th of March. Uh, and then with that, I'll open up for any questions and, and the rest of um, my team will also contribute to that discussion. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Kirsty. Well, there's many people understandably thanking you for your insights and for your putting in the limited energy everyone has in your group um, into this presentation and for you to present today. Um, so a lot of love in the in the comments um, <laughs> Thank <this> you. <laughs> and support and um, acknowledgement. Just just seeing if there's any actual questions. I mean, I think just the main thing is, you know, it's really that your findings are really resonating with people who themselves have long COVID. I've actually got a question. Where can I get, are there any sort of nice little enamel pins with the long COVID ribbon on it that we can, or badges or something? <laughs> Have you got any um, merch? <laughs> I, I'm not sure if one of my um, other long COVID group colleagues might answer that. Um, I know there was a production run. I'm not sure if they're publicly available at the moment. Because that would be great, wouldn't it? Get, yeah. get sort of get the long COVID ribbon way way out there. And there's that amazing guy in the UK, the Save Dave, David Tennant guy. Have you heard about him? Um, he um, goes up. He, he well, he's a huge fan of David Tennant, and he goes up and sort of. Uh, but also, there's other you know, sort of high high profile celebrities that he sort of supports and it's all about sort of reducing exposure for exposure to them and all the events that they do. Um, and so he, he goes along with the long COVID ribbon and hands out pamphlets at sort of big events like Oh awards. yes, of course. The, yeah. the music awards yeah. just recently. Yeah. Yeah, um, I did it with the BAFTA Awards that David Tennant presented. Yeah. Um so um so, so there are yeah. some resources on um on uh, there, there is a website and if you um scan the qr code that'll take you to some resources for social media um so i'm not sure if that says someone in in the comments can pop up whether or not we've got the the ribbons available here in australia um but hopefully we can achieve that in the near future yes. it's robin austin here one of the other people who put this together on those ribbons they are now for sale and certainly if people are interested um maybe through deborah we can um put people in touch with how to how to get them yeah fantastic um and just uh 
Yeah, I don't think there's any other than wanting kind of, you know, access to your resources and, and things like that. Um, there's no actual questions, but it's really more about it, more comments and just saying fabulous work. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so the, so the um, there was quite a detailed submission to the parliamentary long COVID inquiry. Um, so that's um, available um, on the parliamentary inquiry website. Um, and I've also put an email there. Um, to contact the long COVID community if people do want want to follow up, um, and I'm I, I think as well the submission to the the co the pandemic response inquiry was was also posted publicly, or I'm expecting that will happen when those those come out. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so yes, uh, the 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 submissions for those two inquiries, the long COVID inquiry and the the current sort of COVID the response the Australians response. Australia's response to COVID, uh, which is sort of ongoing right now, um, that's a really great source for everyone if they want to um, find out what COVID, long COVID activists and other COVID activists are doing, and because they can read read those submissions um, on the sites of those, those two inquiries. So yes, I absolutely go there and and have a read if you're interested in following up. Um, so I think now we will draw it to a close. I think we've kept fairly well. We have run a bit over time, but that's not too bad for an academic <laughs> symposium. Um, and think it's run fairly smoothly too for an online academic symposium. So I'm feeling pretty pleased with all that. Um, so thanks everyone. Thanks for your um, thanks for everyone's contributions today, including all the comments in the chat and the sharing of information, as well as the presenters. Um, and yes, if you are able to come back at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time tonight, I know that some people won't work with their time zones, but for those who can, there'll be another range of fantastic presentations later, uh, later tonight in the evening. So thanks everyone though for coming along today. And yes, there will be a, a recording available of, of both sessions to catch up on. So thanks again and goodbye for now. <laughs>